Hello, boys and girls, ladies and germs. This is Tim Ferriss. Welcome to another episode of The Tim Ferriss Show. We're getting close to 700 episodes, crazy to think. And my guest today, long overdue, is Jason Calacanis. Calacanis, don't leave out the second A, folks. He has invested in more than 300 startups in the past decade, was Sequoia Capital's first scout, and is the author of the book Angel. He also hosts two podcasts we're going to talk quite a bit about, This Week in Startups and All In. You can find him online at Calacanis, that's C-A-L-A-C-A-N-I-S dot com, and on Twitter at Jason, because he was an early bird on the Twitter platform. Jason, nice to see you, man. It's nice to see you, brother. You and I have random phone calls for like an hour or two, and I think this is the first time we're actually recording it. It's the first time. (laughs) I listened to, I would say, two out of three of your episodes. Thank You've you. You've had a lot of investors on. I have. I have. Somebody's like, how come you haven't been on Tim Ferriss' podcast? I'm like, he's got so many investors on. What can I add, right? And you know, oh, like, I'm sure at some point- There's a lot. Well, sure, I'm sure. But I mean, <laughs> it is so great to see how well your podcast has done over the years. Oh, thanks, man. So I remember the first time I met you in Tahoe with, I guess, Saka. Mm-hmm. And it was like, hey, this is a four-hour work week guy. And I was like- you know how hard you're making my life? All, all these founders, I mean, now they think I work four hours and started breaking their jobs. <laughs> uh, uh, it's part of the charm. Yeah, it is, it's part of the charm. Good to see you. It is good to see you. And so uh, you, I consider a master of podcasting. We're going to come back to that because I have some other questions maybe before that. But I wanted to give an example of a great piece of tactical advice. And you actually told me about this before we started recording. Mm. QuickTime. So we are both running backup QuickTime audio. So we have yes. extra local copies in case something breaks, because things often break. Yes. What was the what was the tactic that you shared? Because it's so smart. You load a QuickTime thing and you're like, hey, can you start a QuickTime? People go, Oh yeah, my QuickTime's running. But then one out of three times at the end of the show, we're like, okay, can you upload the QuickTime? I'm like, oh, I didn't hit the record button. So instead of asking, can you, you know, record a QuickTime, I say, how many seconds is your QuickTime running? Mm-hmm. And they say it's 36 seconds. Now I know it's running. Mm-hmm. And, but the bigger piece is there's this book, uh, The Checklist Manifesto. You and I are obsessed with yeah. probably part of our kinship. A tool go on day. Yeah, we're both into like tools and optimization. And this book, I had heard Jack from Twitter would give it to every Square employee, give it to every Twitter employee, The Checklist Manifesto. And I make everybody read it. I'm obsessed with checklists. And so, you know, because people forget. People forget. And all those great stories in the book about like surgeons and pilots were like, oh, incredible. I don't need a checklist. And then everybody dies. <laughs> yeah. And then a nurse comes along and is like, well, I could just make this little checklist for you. And we could just, you know, you say something, I say, okay. You say something, I say, okay. And then all of a sudden you could have yeah. a plane with four engines yep. because people had more discipline. And, you know, and it's like, oh, I know you guys didn't need this checklist, but we have bacterial line infections down by 39% this year. Oh, go look at that. Yeah, it's it's a great book. People would take a scalpel that was dirty and they made this little device, right? These little life hacks, you know, that are, are so much a part of what you do. And by the way, it's super weird for you to tell me that I'm a podcast master because I take notes on your podcast. Works both ways. Anyway, they would put <laughs> a little tent on top of the clean instrument. So like a clean scalpel would have a tent on top. And the nurse was responsible for cleaning everything and putting the tents on. So then they knew it was clean. Mm -hmm. And you take the tent off, now it's been used. So tent on means clean. Don't put the tent on a dirty scalpel. Tent off, no bueno. No bueno. Now, you can't believe everything you read on the internet, so please correct me if I'm getting any of this wrong. But Yeah, sure. You know, your mom was tending to people in the ER your dad yeah. had a had a bar, as I understand it. Yeah. There were times when you would be cleaning blood off the floor from all the brawls and fights. For sure. And then, and then raided at one point, I think, by the, I don't know if it was the FBI, but with like- Tax the sh- authorities. Tax Shotguns. authorities. Yeah, my dad got a little behind on the taxes. Yeah, and, uh, the taxes. They, they sneak up on it, you. It turns out the tax authority- they're kind of humorless, like pay your taxes <laughs> or you go to jail. And so when I was 18 years old, Growing up in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, which is the last stop on the train, just to give you an idea of how far out there it is. This is in the 70s and 80s. In 1988, my dad's bar, after the stock market crashed, he went into basically debt and he was really gnarly. And then one summer afternoon in July, the feds basically and the tax authority came and 
padlocked the place, took everything out of it. And, you know, this close to my dad going to jail and had, you know, one of the great traumas of my life. And it's one of the mm -hmm. things I really appreciate and respect about you is you shared your trauma on this podcast. It's like a gift to the world. Mm. You know, that's a pretty scary thing when you're 17 years old and you're like, dad says, I'm sorry, son, I don't have money for college. I'm probably going to jail. I tried to make this business work. It didn't work. Mm. Take care of your mom. Like, whoa. That's it's kind of like that scene when, uh, if you remember The Empire Strikes Back, and like Han Solo comes over to Chewbacca. It's like, mm. just take care of the princess. I'll be back. Yeah. You know, it was really intense. Really intense. Yeah. Yeah, I bet that's... Crazy. And that, and that really is like my yeah. life just got crazier and crazier after that, right? Like, so I forged such a crazy childhood that was so violent and crazy and just Brooklyn when it wasn't cool that it kind of made when I went into business, I was yeah. kind of like, well, I, there, I don't have to worry about somebody jumping me. Like, <laughs> there's no violence here. Like, I'm not going to be murdered. I'm not going to jail. It's like, wow, this is easier. <laughs> but I didn't know that world existed. Yeah. You know, the only world I knew was the people who hung out at my dad's bar, the mafia, the Hell's Angels, a bunch of cops, some percentage of which were in on the take with the other two groups, uh, <laughs> and then a bunch of Wall Street people. And so it was like out of a film like Goodfellas. Tim, I kid you not, like I would, <laughs> I would have to go serve espresso to the bookie yeah. or the, the dealer <laughs> or the head of the Hell's Angels. Like it was bonkers it, and you know, it just made me really good at dealing with people. I think. Yeah. I would imagine you developed a lot of situational awareness. Adaptations, right? Yeah. yeah. You get a lot of adaptations real quick when you're dealing with those different types of individuals. But I look back on it now and I'm like, did that really happen? And then I look back <laughs> at this, what's happening in my life now. And I'm like, is this really happening? So yeah. it's, it's been a pretty surreal life the whole way I have to say. So if we flash forward a little bit and we, we don't necessarily have to spend a ton of time on this, but Silicon Alley Reporter, in the beginning, I mean, you're photocopying it yourself. You're hand delivering yeah. it to coffee shops and other spots. Yeah. Did you know or decide you were going into business for yourself to be an entrepreneur? And I ask, especially given what you saw happen to your dad, right? I can see yeah. some people responding by going entirely in the opposite direction, getting the safest nine to five possible. So how did you end up an entrepreneur. So having a dad who's an entrepreneur, it kind of puts it in you. Yeah. And I, you know, had one or two jobs when I was in college. I went to college at night. So I was would fix laser printers and build networks. This is before the internet existed. You would have to connect computers together with coaxial cables and create what's called a local area network. And I did a couple of those jobs and it was well paying and it helped me pay for college because remember my dad had no money. So I had to pay for all this on my own. It took me five years to go through school at night. But when I would ride the train in, I would look at people reading magazines. And then I would go to cafes because, you know, sort of pre the web and mobile phones and we'd go hang out in cafes, you know, in the Lower East Side, Bleecker Street, wherever the village. You know, when I was in college, we'd go play chess on Bleecker Street or read magazines or free newspapers. And I just looked at the people who were in the pictures, Tim, and I was like, why are they in the, on the cover of the magazine? Why, why is this person on the cover of Spy Magazine? Why is this person on the cover of Paper Magazine? Why are people important? All I knew was nurses, doctors, lawyers, cops, firefighters. That, that's all I was exposed to. I didn't understand there was other stuff in the world. Mm -hmm. Then I went to school in Manhattan at night, and I would work in Manhattan during the day. And I was looking around going, oh, who's that person getting out of that like limousine to go into that big, tall building? What's in that big, tall? Oh, those are apartments? Like it was really weird, like being dropped on an alien planet because Brooklyn was so different than Manhattan at the time. Yeah, for sure. Brooklyn was a bunch of blue collar people. Manhattan were rich people uh, and powerful people. And so it, something just clicked in my brain. I said, I want to be powerful. I want to be rich. I want to be on the cover of a magazine. And I started looking at the magazines and then I discovered the masthead. Mm -hmm. And I saw the masthead and I said, wait a second. What's the, who's the publisher and the editor in chief? Who has more power? Who, who is this editor at large? That sounds more important, but wait, it's in a smaller font and lower. And then I started to meet people and I started asking them, like, what's this? What's that? And I was at a party. I ran into somebody at Barney's. Somebody had invited me to a party in the basement of Barney's. I'm talking to this guy and I said, what are you doing? He says, uh, oh, I, I work at a magazine. I said, what magazine do you work at? I said, Let me pause for a second. Barney's sounds fancy. How did you get invited to the party? You know what? I just was hanging out in the downtown scene where 
company called Voyager was making CD-ROMs. Blender was making CD-ROMs. A friend of mine, Josh Harris, was doing Sudo, and he was doing mm-hmm. online chat rooms with Prodigy. So I was just hanging around with the tech scene there, and it was probably 50 people who were in the tech scene because the only thing that existed were online services, dial-up, CompuServe, Prodigy, The Well. It was just a small set of dial-up services, and I knew how to use a modem, and I knew about the internet. So I kind of started to meet those people, and then those people started to tip over into the media business in New York. Yeah. And because the media business was very attracted to, oh, you can dial up and read an article. People started to put these connections together. Magazines plus a dial-up service. Music plus a dial-up service. Booking a, f- a ticket to a movie, a dial-up service. So, it, and oh, a CD-ROM has a video on it or it has a, an article. So you could make a CD-ROM with an article end. So this multimedia thing happened. And then I was at Sony setting up their computer networks when the internet happened. And then Sony was going to build a website. And so I was on the website team. And the mm-hmm. website was a picture of 10 Sony logos. Sony Music, <laughs> Columbia Records. We literally set 10 people in a room designing a, a web page with 10 logos on it. That was the entirety of the website. It was one page. Uh, and then like a 12-page legal disclaimer. So it's this very interesting like moment in time. And uh, I said, what magazine? He said, Paper Magazine. I said, you work at Paper Magazine? Yeah. And he said, I created Paper Magazine. I said, what, what do you mean you created it? Like you work at the printer? He said, no, no, I, I'm the editor-in-chief. I'm David Hershkowitz. I said, tell me everything. So I start talking to him. He says, well, wh- why don't you come by my office? Because I'm setting up my dial-up. <laughs> and I said, okay. And I go down to his office, uh, which was sort of where Balthazar is now, on Broadway, at Lower Broadway. And you know, I help him with his internet and we're talking about dial-up services. You should write a column for us about the internet and this technology stuff. So I started writing for Paper Magazine. And I was like this little nerdy kid and I didn't know how to write. I didn't know how to spell. I didn't know how to put a comma in a sentence. <laughs> and Christine Mulhucky was my editor. She was like 20 something years old. I was 20 something years old. Started writing for Paper Magazine. And then Hershkowitz is like, he was really getting into the internet. And I remain friends with him to this day, 30 years later. And he would just ask me to come by the office. I hang out. I'm hanging at Paper Magazine. And he's like, hey, you want to go to a concert tonight? And like, yeah, sure. And he says, yeah, we're going to go uh, to the Roxy this uh, new band, Chemical Brothers, is going to be playing. <laughs> Orb's going to be opening for them. And then we're in like the green room or the, the, the VIP room waiting for to go on. And he's like, oh, Jason, uh, this is, I meet this woman from Iceland. And, and I'm like, oh, you're from Iceland? Where is that? Is it like Norway or Sweden? And she's like, no, it's like over here. And, and she's talking really low. And I'm like, so what do you do? She's like, well, I have a record coming out. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. What kind of music is this? Like these guys? Says, no, I just, I'm a singer. I say, oh, I'm Jason. And she goes, I'm Bjork. <laughs> you know, this is New York in the nineties. I mean, it was cool as F like yeah, yeah. it was, and it was the zeitgeist was crazy. And so all of this starts to spiral. And I just said, I need to make a magazine. And David had showed me the early issues of paper. Yeah. And paper magazine was originally. I've never heard you censor your cursing before. That was very well, delicate I, it's of you. It's a family you. show, I think. Right? It's a family show. <laughs> you can curse. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you don't, don't tell a kid from Brooklyn to start cursing. It's just, your poor editors are going to be. He just created three hours oh, oh of boy. Anyway. Search for place. We, we have 47 fucks in the first 30 minutes. All right. All right. 47 Good. fucks again. So anyway, it's, it's actually kind of fun to remember all this stuff. So he starts, he, he takes me to the archive room, a paper magazine, which was a glossy at the time. And he says, look, it was a foldable thing. I got a foldable piece of paper and I folded it and we would just put it for free, you know, in uh, cafes. And I was like, you know when like the Terminator, you see from his view and like all yeah. the words are going by and he's just like <laughs> processing everything really fast. That was happening in my brain. I was like, okay, wait, wait free, fold it, print it, what? Okay, do this. I'm taking all of these instructions. <laughs> and I literally went to Tower Records, which is a place where they used to sell CDs and records. Oh, yeah. And they had a zine section. And zines were short for magazines, Z-I-N-E, for people who are under the age of 40. And this was like the most punk rock thing you could do after being in a punk rock band was to start a zine. And a zine just meant you got your friends together and wrote an article together, and then you would photocopy it. So 2600 famously was a zine about hacking in New York. And I had met the founder of that. So there's like a little zine culture going on. And I was like, huh, all my friends are starting internet stuff. I'm writing about the internet once a month. I write 400 words. I could write 40,000 words. I could write 4,000 words, whatever. And people had never been to San Francisco or Silicon Valley, but people were starting somebody referred to what we were doing as Silicon Alley. I was like, Silicon Alley? That's rad. (laughs) And then I had seen somebody, I was like, well, I I should be a reporter about Silicon Alley. I could do like a 
Silicon Alley reporter. And it'd just be me reporting on what's happening here. Because this is cool. Like there's like, now it's like 200 people doing stuff. And so I just started a photocopy called Silicon Alley Reporter. And I went up to the village printing shop on 43rd Street and uh, 6th Avenue. And every, any time, every time I'm in New York, I like to walk when I'm in New York just to remind myself of that, those moments in time. And I always walk down that block to see if it's there. Mm. Village printer, I don't know if it's still there, but a couple of years ago, it's still there. And it was 24 hours. And I brought it to the guy and I, he, he's, there's a thing called tabloid paper, you know, eight and a half by 11 plus eight and a half by 11 equals whatever it is, you know, like the 17 by whatever. And uh, you could take that paper, fold it and put a staple in the middle and it would look like a, a newsletter. Huh. And so I said, okay, that's the format. I got page maker. I started laying it out. I took pictures. I wrote a couple of articles and I went there and I printed it. And he said, yeah, it's going to be like 10 cents, a photocopy. And I was like, all right, 80 cents an issue. I could, I could, I could do this. So I go, I said, you make me a thousand copies, 800 bucks, right? And I'm just going to start handing them out like David Hershowitz did. And I go and he hands me a bill for 1750. And I said, wait, you said 10 cents. It's eight pages. He said, it's double sided. I said, it's double sided. I said, I don't have the money. He goes, what do you mean you don't have money? I got a thousand copies of Silicon Alley Reporter. <laughs> and so I start talking to the guy. Now I'm, I'm haggling with him. And he's just the overnight manager. And he said, listen, I, I don't have the money for this. Like I just, I, my credit card's maxed out. Can you do me a favor? Like maybe someday I could do you a favor. I could put an ad in there. And he's like, don't tell anybody, okay? And I was like, no, I won't tell anybody. Like, you know, they got a counter on these things. I could get busted. And I was like, I don't want you to get busted. He's like, I don't know, man. This team's really cool. Just give me 800 bucks. And I just gave him 800 bucks. <laughs> then I realized, like, I started to learn a very interesting lesson in my life that when I ask people things, that many times people will do what I ask them to do, like a Jedi kind of trick. <laughs> Not, but this guy did it out of the kindness of his soul. But I, I kind of started to learn early in my career, like, you could ask for things in the world, even sometimes outrageous things. And Sometimes it happens, right? And I took them over to Roseland where there was an internet party going on or like a, Roseland's a venue, like a music venue. And then some, some electronic music person had played and then like a bunch of internet multimedia people were going to be hanging out. So I walk over there. I had dropped off most of the issues at my little office I had, like a little office share. And then I took like 200 of them in my backpack and in my hands to the party. I get to the party at like one in the morning and I just start handing them to people. And I had like this moment of clarity in my life. I gave away, people started coming up to me to get them. And then I turn around and I look at the party, which was popping off. And every single person has the magazine open, the zine open, the photocopy, and is reading it with two or three people around them. The entire party stopped. So what did that feel like? Like what happened to you in that, when you saw that? Power. Ah, uh, okay. Tell me more. I got the power. You got the power. Yeah. And so remember I said I had no power as a child and they take your dad's bar? Yeah. Like we're going deep into the trauma work here. <laughs> Listen, I, 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 you know, I consider it a privilege to be on here and you've shared a lot, like and if this helps other people. But you know, when you don't have power and you're a kid and you live a scared life, uh, which I did, and then all of a sudden, the entire party in Manhattan is in the palm of your hand and something you created has stopped everybody dead in their tracks. The adrenaline and the confidence, it felt like, you know, all of a sudden Superman like figures out like, you know, when he reaches into the fire to, to get something he dropped and it's like, oh, the fire doesn't burn me? Whoa, right. like, I can fly? Like <laughs> just this incredible wing sprouted. And I was like, wait a second, I could be an entrepreneur. I could do something in the world. And mm. the next day I was at it. My phone was ringing, people were calling me. And then I just made a set of postcards that said, subscribe to the Silicon Alley Reporter, 10 issues a year, $90. And I had seen Esther Dyson charged $1,000 for her newsletter. So I was like, well, she's Esther Dyson. So if I charge 10%, maybe that's the same thing. <laughs> Esther Dyson was this famous you know, uh, yeah. angel investor. And I just, when I went out, I didn't have the magazine on me. I had the cards. And I would just hand the cards. And then within two or three months, I would get to my office share and there would be a stack of envelopes. And it would be 20 people sent me $90, it's oh, $1,800. Mailbox every money. Day, $4,000, $6,000. <laughs> and all of a sudden there was like thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 people subscribing. You know, and it was kind of like the Kevin Kelly, like you only need 2,000 true fans. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I was like, 
wait a second, I can quit my jobs. I can do this. I'm David Hershevitz and Kim from paper. I did it. Yeah. And it was like, whoa. It, and this all happened within 60 days. Wow. From a nobody trying to get into a party to meet somebody to all of a sudden, every CEO and person trying to meet me. And it was basically like this all of a sudden becomes the sliding door kind of moment of your life. Like some random occurrence happened. I meet David Hershkovitz at a party. I get this guy to print out the things. I go to that party and drop him off. And all of a sudden, I'm important. Mm. But remember, I wasn't covering tennis. I wasn't covering wine. I was covering this new thing called the internet when the browser didn't support graphics. So the timing was so insane because the internet, you talk about this far as scum thing. So that's a problem. This is going to, now I, this is going to stick. <laughs> Everyone's going to be like, well, I guess laughs like a box of chocolates, Tim. Uh, <laughs> you just tell me the far as scum of the, the internet industry, it's going to stick forever. Uh, I, I'll take it. I'll take it. Far as scum had a great life. Yeah, yeah, he did. And he did. Uh, that was the start of a great life for a very simple man. <laughs> So I'm so glad we're talking about the early days because, uh, yeah. of course, I had no idea of a lot of But this. you had now, the same thing. Nobody knew who you were. You're some guy and you all of a sudden this four-hour work week goes from yeah. like you got paid nothing for that book. Nothing. And then all of a yeah. sudden, it, it was, wasn't was it the same exact experience? It was similar. It was similar, yeah. It was very similar. I remember when the book came out and I got a call from my editor, Heather Jackson, at the time, and she said, why, hello, Mr. New York Times bestselling author, and I had just finished a day of radio satellite tours, which people did back in the day. They may still do them. And I would, had two pots of coffee, and I was just exhausted. And I, and I sat down on the floor, and I, was, and I said, Heather, don't fuck with me. I'm too tired. <laughs> and she said, I'm serious. No, you made it. You're 15 on the extended list, so not in print, but you're on the list, technically. Whoa. And I thought to myself, oh, wow, things are about to change. Yeah. Things are about to change. And yep. all of a sudden, you know, let's call it within the next few weeks, you know, it, it kept growing and then it stayed on the list for, stayed on the print list for, I want to say, four years plus unbroken. And in the beginning, I started getting these calls asking me to speak, offering to pay me for keynotes. I mean, none of this had happened before. And it was uh, mind blowing, bewildering. Yeah, very bewildering. The speaking gig is an interesting moment. Yeah. Because you work your whole life, you make 30 grand, 40 grand a year. And then this kind of stuff happens to you. And then somebody calls, like, oh, uh, Tim, would you like to come speak at this corporate thing? And you're like, uh, uh, why would I speak there? Oh, well, you know, your book. And, and you're like, okay. And they're like, well, we, of course, we'd like to give you an honorarium. And you're like, okay. And they're like, and it's $30,000 or $40,000. <laughs> and you're like. Say what? That's what I made last year. <laughs> come again? <laughs> $3,000? No, no, that is zero, 30000 And you're just like, that makes no sense. And they're like, well, it's going to be two hours of your time. We don't want to put you out, Mr. Ferris. And like, can I do it tomorrow too? <laughs> it, it is a mind-blowing experience. I always, yeah. like, I literally just had one of these come in today, some corporate gig. And, you know, because All In has gotten so popular, all of a sudden now yeah. people want me to speak at a bunch of stuff again. And it's just like the numbers are mind boggling. And you're just like, isn't it very weird? Yeah. How like you can go from being an absolute nobody to somebody wanting to give you tens of thousands of dollars to speak for an hour. That really screwed with my mind a lot. Also, because I had a lot of feelings of guilt and stuff about my parents. And I was like, you're offering me a speaking gig, which is what my mom or dad made in a year. In a year. Yeah. It's weird. You also had this kind yeah, of- same situation. Yeah. So weird. It really does screw with your head. And it's very hard to stay grounded or figure out what's actually happening, right? Yeah. So let's talk about another holy shit moment. And this is January of 99. You're offered 20 million, I believe. It's a true story. And the commerce business. So I'm reading here, this is from Fast Company, and it talks about your interaction with Douglas Rushkoff. Oh, Doug Rushkoff. Yeah, my friend in New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was another guy who taught me so much. I love Doug. So walk me through getting this offer, the conversations you had, the decision you made, and then what, if anything, you kind of take from that to this day, if you wouldn't mind. The magazine had gotten very big and it became a color glossy. I had almost a hundred people working for me. It was 300 pages and it was during the dot-com boom. We're, we're talking about 1999 now, right? Yeah. So the magazine is doing, you know, six, seven, eight million a year. I had done an event or two that started making two or three million. So now we're like, I got $11 million company. I built up my credit cards. And I was making 
just you know a couple of years earlier minimum wage to work in the computer room at uh, Fordham, which was three fifty an hour, and then I was fixing laser printers for nine dollars an hour, and then I got a job at Amnesty International doing their internal network for twelve dollars an hour. So all of this happens in a very short period of time. And, you know, again, for a poor kid from Brooklyn, I'm just trying to navigate it. And this guy, Alan Meckler, had internet.com. He took it public. It became worth a billion dollars. And he offered me 20 million bucks for Silicon Alley Reporter. But it was my identity. Yeah. And it was making 10 million. And I was like, I don't want to give up my identity. But I thought about it. And I said, well, if I can, make, if I can clear a million or $2 million a year off the magazine and profits, it'd be the same amount of money. So maybe I wouldn't do it. And then the dot-com bust happens and I lose everything. And I wind up selling the scraps of the business to Dow Jones and they give me two years of salary and the magazine's dead and I get two years at $300,000, maybe five or $600,000 in like this employment agreement and they paid off all the bills because I then had, like my dad, I was in arrears when the magazine collapsed. If you got a magazine about the internet and the internet collapses. <laughs> Tough business. <laughs> not only did I not have any money, all the money that was owed to me never showed up. Ugh. Because all the companies had gone out of business. Yeah. So I was like, you owe me for three ads. They're like, the phone number didn't pick up. Like the company was shut down. Then I show up for work at Dow Jones and they say, hey, can we take you for a walk? Like manager, middle of manager guy. And I'm like, sure, walk. Okay, sure. We'll go for a walk. We walk. Say, hey, listen, you know, you're so talented. We don't think, you know, this is, we can, you know, you being here and you're so talented. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, <laughs> so, you know, like you should go do something else. And I'm like, are you firing me? And they're like, yeah, we don't need your services. I said, like, you just bought my company. And the 20, you know, I had like 20 people left and they had reassigned them to this other venture capital thing they were doing. They said, you don't want me, Jason Calacanis, the Silicon Alley reporter to work here. They said, no. I said, I just signed a contract with you for 600, you know, five or $600,000. They said, yeah. And he pulls out an envelope and he hands me a check for $500,000. <laughs> he says, we're paying out your contract. <laughs> Tim, you're the first person I've, I've told these stories to. Wow. Literally. This is like literally wow. like the crazy life I've lived. And I am looking at a $500,000 check, which, which is a, an extraordinary amount of money, obviously. Yeah. And the only thing I can think is I want to beat the shit out of this guy. Uh, Just fucking fired me. Yeah. They don't want me. Yeah. I went from being a nobody to running New York, being on Charlie Rose, being on the cover of the New York Times, having a New Yorker thing being written about me, you know, just living like the, the peak New York experience. Yeah. Living in a loft in Manhattan, sitting at, you know, in the first three or four rows of the Knicks games, hanging out with Allen Houston, you know, the number one star on the Knicks at the time. I mean, I was living it. The peak. And then overnight, boom, everything's gone. I got a 500 K check in my hand and nothing. Nobody wants me. And I got so the the rage and I felt in that moment was like Hulk-like rage. Like I was a berserker, like the samurai armor just took the sword out. And I was like, I am going to prove I can do this again. I am going to show everybody that this was not a fluke. Hmm. It made me, I, I've never felt more rage in my life, I don't think. Hmm. But I've been in some pretty big brawls. And so then I just took the money. I got an office. And the next day I said, I got to build something. I got to build something. The next day. The next day. I was like literally got an office share in my friend's office. I said, can I get a desk? And it was like, you know, it was like that blank sheet of paper in 2002, 2003. I got to figure something out. What's next? And I just started making designs on whiteboards. Yeah. I was going to ask like that day, how do you even begin with such a blue sky blank page? Yeah. How did you even start? Were you just pulling from random bits and pieces floating around? Did you have some approach? I started calling people up. I started calling people up. What are you working on? What's happening? And then, you know, like this one person was making this photo sharing site, Flickr. Another person was doing a bookmarking site called Delicious. It was just this little underground of people who were building stuff for the web because the web had gotten advanced now in the second decade and the web pages could refresh themselves with Ajax and there were kind of tables got became more responsive and there were all these like new technical things and then editorial formats people were playing with. And I was like, huh, who's doing anything? And then there was this like one group doing like journaling on the web, another group that was, you know, trying to do like photo sharing. 
and follow your friends. It's like, huh. And then I had somebody who had worked for me named Rafat Ali. And he had now, started let me interrupt blog. for one second. So the reason you're calling these people is not because you want to work with them on what they're doing necessarily, yeah. or was it? Or, or were you just no, trying to get more a read like, of hey, the landscape? It was literally just trying to network with people mm -hmm. who I had known. And I was literally asking people like, what's going on? Like, mm -hmm. what, is anybody doing anything cool? Yeah. And I just started looking for people doing cool projects just to see what was going to happen after the dot-com bus because everybody quit and everybody went and got jobs at I big companies. It. So you're trying to get a read of the, of the playing field to see where the puck yes. might be going next. Exactly. Is there anything interesting in the world? I'm mixing my sports metaphors, but you get the idea. Yeah. I'm talking about field hockey, everybody. Yeah. yeah okay. Let's just say like <laughs> Tim Ferriss, when he learns a sport, it's wild to watch. Watching Tim Ferriss learn a sport is oh, yeah. hilarious because I oh, taught yeah. him how to do a layup. It is funny. <laughs> I taught him how to dribble a basketball. It was hilarious. That's another story. Yeah. It but is anyway. funny. And also, if you learn a sport with Jake Al, you are going to have to listen to so much shit. It I'm will be, torture you. Yeah, he will torture you at every opportunity. Yeah. Watching Tim Ferriss go from like being a perfect fencer or perfect yoga, you know, in negative 100 degree and then he tries to dribble a basketball it's literally like looking like a <laughs> drunk person with the blindfold on oh yeah but to your credit true story i watched you learn how to do a layup and i gave you you asked me like three or four questions and you went from looking like you were blind and drunk to all of a sudden doing a layup in under like three minutes perfectly mm. and i was like yeah that's tim ferris's gift he knows how to ask the right questions and like <laughs> i'm watching you process it's actually impressive thanks man but anyway it was like one of those moments where you're like, what's next in the world? I was just trying to figure out what was next. And so I was just, because also so many people were out of work mm -hmm. that if you couldn't get a job, you kind of just started tinkering, which is kind of how multimedia started. So I was like, I've seen this before. Technology keeps going. People are starting to tinker. And Wi-Fi had come out at that time. I was very fascinated about Wi-Fi. And I was thinking about Wi-Fi routers and putting Wi-Fi in places and you know, maybe you could have internet and cafes and stuff. I was just like all kinds of crazy little ideas. And I started whiteboarding stuff. I started, Cosmo had gone out of business, the delivery service. So the first idea I had was for Mercury Club. And I was going to get a hundred New Yorkers and give them Mercury Club number one, two, three, four, five, all the way to a hundred. I was going to give one to Charlie Rose, one to Howard Stern. And my idea was to get a bunch of people on Vespas because I had gotten a Vespa. And I was driving around New York and I realized, because I had driven one in Barcelona. I was like, if you're in a city, a bike's too slow a car's too slow, and a Vespa goes fast because you can just weave in and out traffic. And I had seen Cosmo had started experimenting with Vespas. And I said, I'm going to create a service where you pay $100 a month for rich people and you get four hours of deliveries, mm. 25 bucks an hour. This is when you know minimum wage was six or seven bucks, but this is only for rich people. And if you needed a bottle of wine or a pack of cigarettes, whatever, you would just call an 800 number because 800 numbers were another like platform like they became zines for a while 1-800 flowers 1-800 mattress 1-800 everything mm -hmm. and so i started looking into buying a 1-800 number because i was just always very interested in mediums right because if you get to a medium first you can exploit it yeah whether it's podcasting like you and i did or blogging like i did and you did i think or oh, yeah. zines during 2005 blog yeah. yeah so like if you get to it first you get to play with it first you get a disproportionate amount of credit for being there first just like you know, if you go to Austin first or you go to, yep. you know, Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn first, you get the cool loft that you bought for nothing and then everybody else comes and your loft goes up in value, right? So the value of the platform goes up as the people who tinker and create it get to play with it, right? So mm -hmm. I never really actually thought about it, but it is true. Yeah. And so I also got the 800 number. So like, yeah, 1-800-MERCURY. I said, trying to get a Mercury Club number. And my idea was the reason, because I remember I talking to the guy who had done Cosmo because I covered it in my magazine. And he said, yeah, I just, I should have just charged a delivery fee because he, in the last six months they started charging a delivery fee. And he said, yeah, the business worked in three of the nine cities. If I had only yeah. charged delivery fees, I was like, why didn't you? He's like, VCs told me not to. I just wanted to grow. I'm trying to get public. <laughs> this is literally the same lesson people are learning now. Yeah. So I was like, well, wait, instead of charging a delivery fee, why don't I just make it like, because I knew bike messengers, bike messenger culture was like a big thing in New York. So the bike messengers used to hang out outside where my loft was because it was business commercial loft at the Star at Lehigh building in New York. It was like commercial and we were living there illegally. Me, DJ Spooky, a couple of our artists were living in these illegal lofts. Anyway, the bike messengers were out the whole time. They were always smoking weed and just, it was like, it was like a very cool culture because they had figured out life. They would make like 10 bucks per run. They could do two runs an hour 
and they got to just bomb these bikes all over Manhattan. And they got exercise. They were fit. They were smoking weed, listening to music. It was like the coolest gig ever. I was like, these guys, they figured out life. Yeah, yeah. Like, you get to ride your bike all day, smoke dope, listen to cool music, joke with your friends, and you just drop off an envelope now and again, and you make more money than the people you're dropping off the envelope to. But you're outside. It was, like just, it was like a crazy revelation I had. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to do Mercury Club. And I built the whole business model for Mercury Club. How did you land on the name? Well, Mercury, like the god with the wings yeah. on the feet. Yeah, and I was it. just like, okay. it came to, well, I was Greek. I always like the Greek god. So I was just like, yeah, I kind of started thinking about like fast. And I just thought, well, this would be incredible. Can you imagine you're like at like your Charlie Rose at a party or David Hershkovitz from paper? And you're just like, yeah, oh, you should we get cigarettes? Yeah. And you just pick out your, because mobile phones had come out at that time. So imagine taking out your StarTac. And I had seen a StarTac phone, those little flip phones. It's like, imagine you take that out, you dial an 800 number and you say, yeah, I need two packs of Marlboro Lights. And, uh, you know, bring me the, uh, a copy of Vanity Fair or Esquire magazine because mm -hmm. I'm at a party. I want to show somebody. And then just somebody comes there and hands it to you. Yeah. Like the ultimate luxury, like the ultimate power move. Like I can just mm -hmm. call my assistant and just get anything I want. Anyway, I didn't wind up building that. So Greek, yeah. your yeah. name is Greek. What does your last name mean? Kalikanis. Kalikanis. Yeah. So Kalikanis means to have done well uh -huh. or good for you. So sometimes when I use my credit card and a Greek person does it, they're like, good for you, or you've done well. Oh, very nice. But it's with Ks. So when my grandfather went through Ellis Island, I rest his soul, they were like, Calicanus, here's your banana. Keep moving. And he was like, no, it's Ks. And they were just like, fuck you, Calicanus. Here's your banana. They used to give you a, no, they used to give bananas at what? Ellis Island, I understand. That's real? Yeah, it was like some weird okay. thing where they just would give everybody who comes in like a banana because they were hungry off the boats and bananas were, a lot of bananas were coming in from South America to Ellis wow. Island as well. So they'd just be like, here, have a banana, keep moving. Today I learned, keep it moving. And then the crazy thing, Tim, is I, I was on uh, the Ellis Island website. Uh -huh. And on the Ellis Island website, I searched for my last name and they had archived everything. And Calacanis, my grandfather, went through like 12 times. And it turned out huh. he was in the Merchant Marines. He was an engine captain. And I knew that. But every time he came back to America with human passengers, huh. he had to sign in again. And so he has gone through like 12 times. Wow. That's wild. Yeah. And I was like, wow, he's coming from Brazil. He's coming from Ireland. He's coming from Italy. He's coming from everywhere in the world. The cargo was humans. It was Americans. That's incredible. Pretty crazy, right? That is wild. So anyway, I had watched the blog stuff happen. And two people who had worked for me, Shenny Jardin was my event producer. I, she had been working for a famous law firm, Latham Watkins. They were a sponsor of one of my events. She did a great job at the event. I asked Latham, can I hire her? Because she's awesome and rad. And I hired Shenny to come work with me at Silicon Valley Party. She would produce my events. And then when everything shut down, she started working on this like boing boing thing. And I'm like, yeah. boing boing? What are you doing with your life? She was like, yeah, we write blog posts. I'm like, blogs? Blogs? <laughs> and I, I was like, like Rafat Ali was doing? So this kid who had worked for me, Rafat Ali, was doing a blog on the site called paycontent.org. And uh, somebody ratted him out when he was working at the magazine. Yeah. And he was moonlighting. Now, back in the day, you couldn't have a side hustle. That was like instant firing. Yeah. So I call him into my office. I'm like, you got something to tell me, kid? He's like, no. I'm like, you sure you don't have anything to tell me? He's like, is it about paid content? And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, what, what are you doing? He's like, I'm just writing about people who are charging for content on the internet. I'm like, hey, kid, information wants to be free. Nobody's paying for content on the internet. He goes, actually, I think you're wrong. I'm like, hold on, kid. Let me stop you. Number one, nobody's paying for content. The whole reason we started the internet is information wants to be free. Number two, you're not a great writer. I'm your editor. Who's your editor for paidcontent.org? And he goes, I don't have an editor. It's a blog. I'm like, no publication will ever work if there is not an editorial structure. <laughs> it will fail because there'll be spelling errors. You're going to write stupid headlines. You need an editor. That's how this works. He's like, am I fired? I'm like, no, just focus on work and stop doing stupid shit on the weekend. Back to your desk. I just like admonished Rafat. Now I'm an investor in this company, now Skiff. But that accepted in me because when we shut down, I had talked to Shenny and I talked to Rafat. And Rafat's like, yeah, I'm making like four grand a month on ads. I'm like, I was paying you 35K. You're, you're making 4K now? You're making 48,000? You're making $13,000 more than when you work for me? 
And then Shannon's like, I'm getting a 5K draw a month. Yeah. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, how how many hours a day do you work? She's like, like I do like two hours in the morning. And then like at night I come home, I do like two or three hours. So I was like, you know, this is before the four hour work week revolution. <laughs> and this is during the 60 hour reality of being a worker. And I was like, blogs, huh? And then I started reading blogs and I was like, you know, there's something here. Blogs are dope. Blogs, even though they have spelling errors in them, come out faster than magazines and newspaper articles. They're faster. And faster is always better. It's faster. I said, and for the right writer, it's spicy. Like, oh, Shenny's spicy. And I remember, like, I wouldn't have let her, her write that. I would have stopped her. And then I was, then it, you know, just like when I saw all the magazines and everybody had them, I just all of a sudden, the Terminator, everything clicked at once, Tim. I was like, it's faster and it's better. It's faster, it's better, it's cheaper. Faster, better, cheaper. Wait, I had heard Marvin Minsky and Kevin Kelly and all these guys at like a conference, like a TED at some point talking about faster, better, cheaper. I didn't understand what they meant, but I literally was that like. Ted and they were at like one of Brockman's dinners and they were talking about faster, better, cheaper, whatever, pick two. And I, was, I didn't understand what they were talking about, but it, it had kind of another inception moment. I was like, wait a second. What if you had a hundred of them? So then I, I called Brian Alvey who had worked with me on the magazines and I said, let's go to the Knicks game. We went to the Knicks game. And I said, what if we had web logs? The blogs were originally called web logs because they were on the web and they were logs. And then people dropped the WE and they became blogs. You remember all this, but a little, History lesson for those listening. And so I was like, what if we did weblogs for business? Nobody's ever done a business topic. So we'll do weblogs. And he goes, oh yeah, we should call it Weblogs Inc. And then he got the domain name. And then we started building them. And we did a weblog on Wi-Fi. We did a weblog on Apple. And then we started building all these ones. And in under in 18 months, we had built 87 blogs. We had $200,000 in total revenue and AOL bought it for $30 million. And we had one investor, my friend Mark Cuban had put $300,000 in for 20% of the company or something. And I gave him 6 million back. And then Brian and I and uh, Peter Rojas split the rest. And uh, in 18 months, after my $20 million offer had gone away, I got the $30 million offer. Wow, that's just insane. That's just insane. And the, the berserker, insane J. Cal, I'm going to prove it to the world, proved it. And then I was like, yeah. I just like looked at the sword, took the armor off, hung it up. I was like, yep, yeah, I can do it. I can do it anytime I want. Mm. Anytime I want, I can build a brand, a business, and I can just get it from zero to whatever. Mm. Yeah, I might fail two out of three times, but I could do it. And that was when it was like, okay, you know, once you're lucky. Uh, once you're lucky, twice you're good. Yeah, it was my once you're lucky, twice you're good moment. Because then everybody who had watched me fail and kind of danced on my grave with Silicon Valley Reporter was like, oh God. Oh, yeah. The, the cat came back the very next day. We thought he wasn't gone, but he wouldn't stay away. There's a lot of people who are just like, oh, he's going to be insufferable after this. <laughs> they weren't wrong. They weren't wrong. <laughs> they weren't they wrong. Were wrong. Just a couple of maybe boring housekeeping questions. Yeah, sure. I'm thinking of the timing of building these weblogs. Yeah. How did you find the writers to do this? A great thing for people to understand right now in this moment of time, we're, we're taping this in 2022, the market crashed and uh, Facebook laid off 11,000 people yesterday. Yeah, I don't want to date this too much. I don't know when you're going to- Oh, that's it. okay. It'll come out reasonably soon. I mean, but people, as, as a snapshot in time also, I mean, crypto is having a complete implosion. FTX is going through the meat grinder. People are probably going to go to jail. Yeah, jail, $32 billion eviscerated. I actually wanted to talk to you about like people who commit fraud and lie because I was interested in your perspective on it because I just can't imagine it because the system is so easy to win. Yeah. And the system is set up for entrepreneurs to win in this country. Like why on earth would you cheat if it's so easy yeah. to just have a win by just working hard? Anyway. But I interrupted you because you were, you were tying the weblogs and artists and so on. So it's very simple. Everybody was out of work. And so uh, I just, would, when you hired a writer, you'd say, do you know anybody? And the original deal was we started going to people who were doing like live journal blogs mm -hmm. and like we'd find somebody who had written a blog about Apple, Sean Bonner. Yeah, Sean Bonner. Yeah. yeah. And I said, hey, Sean, um, I'm doing this Weblogs Inc. thing. We're going to try to sell ads on blogs. He's like, well, that's stupid. I'm like, yeah, but I think I could figure it out because I did a magazine. He's like, all right, that's pretty smart. I was like, would you write? I see you're writing some Apple blogs. Could we put them on our Apple blog? Uh, or if I gave you the login, would you post them? Because Brian Alvey, who's a genius. 
he's now running WordPress for for Matt Mullenweg. Oh no kidding! A WordPress like pro VIP that you like people like you and I yeah, use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At Automatic, yeah. At Automatic, and so anyway, he's a great collaborator of my career. He's kind of my uh, George Harrison or yeah, yeah, Paul to my Lennon or vice versa. He had built the software that was better than everybody's, better than Typeform, better than Blogger, better than everything. And uh, I just gave Sean the login, and I was like, "Listen, I want to pay you something." because I want to own the blog posts. He's like, you want to own a paragraph of me writing about a MacBook? <laughs> it's three sentences, Jason. It's worthless. I'll do it for free. And I was like, I'll tell you what, how many a day could you do about Apple products? He's like, two. I was like, okay, 260. I'll give you 150 bucks a month cash mm -hmm. to just let us run these over here. It's a paragraph each. He's like, I can write these in 10 minutes. Like, you're an idiot, but sure, I'll take whatever it is, two or $3 a blog post. So we just started hiring people and then we made it five bucks a blog post, eventually 10 bucks a blog post. And people thought we were stupid because minimum wage at the time was 10 bucks. And people were like, I wrote three blog posts this hour and you gave me $30. <sighs> but I had done a spreadsheet with Brian and I said, here's how many page views we're getting. Here's what I think we could make per page view. Here's what the cost is per blog post. All we have to do with this business is scale it and then somebody will buy it. And he said, yeah, I think you're right. I said, you do the tech, I'll get the writers and the advertising. I'll see you on the other side. And we both put our heads down for 18 months. <laughs> and we had 450 bloggers in the system, of which maybe 200 were active. And we were pounding out thousands of blog posts a week across 87 different topics. And then AOL found out about what we're doing. And they had looked at Gawker and they had looked at us. And Engadget was crushing Gawker because we stole Peter Rojas from Gizmodo, the whole other story. Nick Denton and I had quite a rivalry for a while. It was a fun rivalry too. You know, Peter Rojas was actually the missing piece with Brian Alvey and I. And once we got Peter Rojas, he taught us like, hey, idiots, like just come up with a name for the blogs. I don't want to be gadget.weblogs, Inc. So then we made the apple.weblogs, Inc., the unofficial Apple weblog, TWA, T-U-A-W, which people fell in love with. People were addicted to TWA because at that point we we're doing eight or nine blog posts a day about Apple. And yeah. Steve Jobs read it and Johnny Ive and everybody. And then Engadget became a juggernaut. And it was just a very like, Simple business. And at that time, $30 million was the equivalent of like hundreds of millions now. Like, yeah, for sure. It was a different era. I mean, 30 million today would still be a, a good chunk of change. So let me flash forward. Mm. And I want to ask you specifically, because it came up already, about events. Mm. So you seem to love producing events, and you've produced a lot of events. Yeah. I have only produced one event. In Reno? Oh, Tahoe. It was in Napa. Oh, it was now. Long ago. I have a friend who went. She loved it. Yeah, it was a great event. People still talk about this event. Somebody brought it up last year. They do. They do. It was called Opening the Kimono, OTK. I actually have a wine bottle from that event over there because we made a, mm -hmm. we had a wine making competition that the participants all engaged in. And then we took the winner and we bottled whatever it was, 200 bottles and gave them to everybody. So it was incredibly elaborate. And I came out of that feeling like I had, had just finished a tour of duty. It was so hard. Why do you love doing events? And what is the smart way to do it? What is the J. Cal recipe? In the Myers-Briggs, I'm going to say you're INTJ or INTP. Nailed it. INTJ. Yeah. But I could see you being a perceiver. But anyway, I'm ENTJ. And so you and I vibe until such time as I absolutely exhaust you and you need to go to your room. <laughs> <laughs> and take a deep breath. That's the relationship between INTJs and ENTJs. Like, uh, this is for people who don't know the Myers Briggs, which is, uh, or, or as we call it, astrology for men. Yeah, yeah, that and the Enneagram, astrology for men. Yeah, that's basically it. Like, we don't believe in astrology, but we believe in this other thing where we answer questions and it tells us <laughs> things we want to hear about ourselves. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I scored 86 and 100% on extroversion the two times I took it. Yeah. So I'm so extroverted that when I'm with an introvert like yourself or like say Evan Williams, a friend of ours, yeah. like I can burn people out. I'm just, I want to <laughs> talk for seven hours. And like when I've been on vacation with Tim Ferriss, it's like Tim Ferriss was like, well, that was like an interesting 90 minutes with J-Cal. I need to go write for four hours and or, or whatever. You, you need to recharge your batteries. <laughs> Take a nap. <laughs> Take a nap, whatever. And I, if I talk for seven hours, I want to talk for five more. I just can't yeah. go to bed or I want to start working. And so I think yeah, once you... You have to understand your format. I think the reason why you're the number one you know, guy in, in podcasting is because this format works really well for you. Yeah. You take a lot of time to think about it. You do your 90 minutes. 
and then you got a lot of time to decompress and process. For me, I do my show five days a week and all in six days a week. I like to talk every day. I'm like the morning radio guy, right? Yeah. And you're like the weekly 60 minutes guy. Yeah. Right. And, and viva la difference. The problem with events <laughs> is some people who are introverts, if they do an event, they need recovery time. Mm -hmm. And so for you to do an event, it should be you interview somebody on stage. You then go backstage and write some more notes and then somebody else interviews somebody and then you come back out and do a Q&A with the audience and then the event's over and that's the totality of the events. Yeah. I did a bunch of events because I realized if you can manifest a community in a real world space, again, back to like my childhood need to be important or have power, which was based on having no power and no money. And, uh, you know, I feel like I've kind of processed that now, like I've yeah. kind of processed it if I'm honest, like maybe 15, 20 years ago, I kind of figured it out. But I, I love the idea that if you host the party, those people get to meet new people, create some relationship or moment that then changes their life forever. And so what you should be very proud of with your Open the Kimono event is that to this day, people talk about it as a peak experience in their life. And when you think mm -hmm. about what our lives are, in some ways, it's just like Blade Runner. When the Nexus Six is on the roof, and he says, "Like, oh my God, all my, all my memories are going to be gone, like tears in the rain." All we have at the end of this, I believe. I'm not a religious guy; I'm an atheist, but I do know that that singular moment in film is the most powerful moment in any film I've ever seen, and is kind of my spirit moment uh, of any piece of cinema or perhaps even literature. That speech he gives, because that's what we think human existence is about at its core. It's a series of memories you collect over time. You know, you and I playing basketball on that court <laughs> in the woods in Italy, <laughs> laughing our asses off, and then you figuring it out, right? It's just like this is a weird moment in time that when I just start describing it to you, you and I just start laughing. We're, yeah. It's just a great Tim and J. Cal moment that nobody else was there for. It's just the two of us, like literally in a basketball court hidden in the woods in, on a farm in Italy somewhere that we discovered. It's like a really beautiful memory. For me, and I think for you. and Yeah, for me too. We'll get to the end of our lives. And just like that Nexus 6 that has a, you know, this like four-year lifespan, and he's crying for the lost memories. Like, that's all you have. Yeah. And then gone like tears in the rain. So make those memories. Mm -hmm. And that opened the kimono event. I was talking to them about it on Halloween. It was just wow. two weeks ago. Very recent. And, and she was describing how that was like her favorite event. I was like, you've been to mine. And she's like, yeah, but that was the one I like best. <laughs> and so even if that was the only memory that happened there, that was the only tear in the rain, you'll always have that, right? And so I, totally. for me, that's what it is. People have these incredible moments and I have them. Yeah. And I have now, you know, I'm 51. I'm just looking at the next number of years we have left and people of our age, like Dave Goldberg passed, Tony Shea passed, you know, a lot of our friends are gone. Yeah, it's wild. Gone too soon. And now I just look at it and I'm like, how many more memories can I put into the memory bank before the tears in the rain moment? So let's talk about friendship because there are a few things that come to mind when I think J.K.L. and friendship. Mm -hmm. I wanted to actually sidestep and just mention something that ties back to a few things you said that I was going to bring up later, but I'm just going to, we'll, we'll bookmark this one, but this is a quote from October, 2008, when a lot of shit was going down. People may or may not remember if you weren't yes. <laughs> aware of it, a lot of things Oof. were imploding. And your quote at the time in the guardian is everybody else is going to be depressed and drinking and not working. So it's a great time to be an entrepreneur. So that ties into a lot of yeah. what you already said, but on friends, I want to say two things uh, related to that. The first is, let me find this amazing quote. All right, so this is a quote from Douglas Rushkoff. Yes. Exactly. Oh, this is a good one. <laughs> I put yeah, this I on think, the back of my book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Jason would never stab you in the back. He might stab you in the face, though. So <laughs> oh, I really admire you as a friend. And this is not just for me. This is related to other people because you are one of the most loyal friends I have come across in my adult life. And I've seen you defend your friends in so many circumstances where, A, you don't have to out of pure self-interest. B, there's a very good chance it's never going to get back to the other person. Hmm. 
so I have a question for you, and uh, maybe that'll be the first one about loyalty. The second question, because I do want to talk about All In, is going to be how you navigated starting a project with your very close friends and <sighs> all the conflict that ensued, because I have always avoided working, by and large, with my friends. So yeah. loyalty, where does that come from and why? And then, then the navigating starting a project with your close friends. Well, so much of what makes us who we are is, I think, formed in childhood. So when you're a kid, I think you have this like computer hard drive operating system and things start getting written to it. And one of the things that my dad wrote into it is like, hey, you and your brothers, you're the three musketeers, you got to be there for each other. Loyalty above everything else, you always have to have each other's back. And that wasn't just like his operating principle. It was, you're going to get in a fight on the way to school. We live in Brooklyn. This is a dog eat dog world. I want to make sure that you two, you never leave your brothers behind. So that was like one of his rules. Like if you saw two of us and one of the other, where's your brother? Go get your brother. Doesn't matter if it's the oldest, the middle, on the middle, or the youngest. You three have to be by each other's side all the time. Never leave one of your brothers behind. Never let anybody say anything to your brother. Always fight. It's like one of the great things my dad taught me. And it stayed with me. And over time, what I realized was, one of my superpowers is being there for my friends and being a loyal friend. But I guess the Doug Rushkoff quote, <laughs> you know, I might be full contact at times where if I disagree with somebody or <laughs> at times, at times <laughs> I might be like, I don't agree with you or like, that's stupid. Timmy, um, that's the least... ugliest layup attempt I've ever seen. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> I showed you there's a little square box there. Just aim for the box. You missed the entire backboard. There's a little box behind the rim. Is there any way you could put the ball in the box? <laughs> Your chances go up dramatically <laughs> if you hit that box. And you're like, okay, I got it. I'll put it in the box. Um, but anyway, I like to laugh. Uh, I like to be loyal. And I think like I have a large number of acquaintances and then I have a small number of very close friends. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that, that, that seems to me to be a good philosophy. And then, you know, somewhere along the lines, you know, people become transactional with you. You've had this experience. We've talked about it before. You know, everybody wants something from Tim Ferriss. Everybody wants Jason to fix their problems or they think they get a meeting with some buddy who's more famous than the two of us put together, that that magically is going to change their life because they got to talk to the person and tell them their ideas. And I'm like, okay, you're delusional. Like this person does not care about your ideas and they're busy. So like let Travis finish building Uber. He doesn't need to talk to you about your startup. Like that's not going to make any difference. And, you know, it's just, there's something really special about being able to be supportive of your friends and being there for them because as you become more successful, the world People think the world gets bigger. Oh, you have more money. Oh, your podcast went up the rankings. Oh, Tim Ferriss is on his 12th bestseller. The world gets smaller. Yeah, it gets a lot smaller. It gets a lot smaller. And then you're sitting home on a Saturday night when you're famous or affluent or rich or whatever combination of things you succeeded in your life. And it's a Saturday night and you're like, going out to this event is going to be arduous and painful rather than delightful. And, you know, what I realized is, you know, for people who have this in a more, even a more acute fashion than you or me, you know, like you, you have to create, I think, a safe space, a place where, you know, you can have like true friendship and talk about things that matter. Your kids, you know, your, your friendships, your, your spouses, your life, your hopes, your dreams, whatever, or just shoot the shit and watch a movie and laugh. And so it's, it's kind of like one of the great things in life, I think, is friendships. Yeah. The friendships you get are the effort you put into the friendships you have, right? Like, and so people don't invest in it. And the people are so transactional. It's actually kind of weird. I was at a Halloween party and a lot of people were coming up to take pictures and I don't mind it at all. I, I'll take a hundred pictures in a row. It's fantastic. You listen to the pod. I'm super happy. I suppose for you, it's a little bit annoying, the extrovert introvert thing. Like, I bet you can get through about three of them before you feel like you need to leave the party. Yeah, then I need a bathroom break. I do that at dinners. I mean, this, I'll admit something embarrassing, but you won't be surprised. Maybe people listening will. If I go to a dinner with or an event with more than eight or 10 people, I will leave the dinner every 10 minutes to go into the bathroom and just like close my eyes and breathe. <laughs> yes. I will disappear. And people are like, what's wrong with this prostate? But it's actually fine. I'm just so 
overwhelmed by the stimulation that I need to take breaks. It's really extreme. Well, and now imagine it's people who, you know, are a fan of yours or yeah. think that they can use you to achieve some goal, right? Yeah. And literally all these influencers at uh, this party, really like their goal is to just get a picture. And I was just had this like profound sadness for them. I'm like, you know, like if I was meeting me and I was an entrepreneur, like a photo is great, but if you're a first time entrepreneur, like maybe you should ask me about startups and running them or raising money or like yeah. there's, a, there's a million things we could discuss. Yeah. But it, the goal was to get a selfie. Like yeah. who cares? You know, like it just, so anyway, it's important to be, I think a really good loyal friend. I, I have been burned in this regard where I've been more loyal to certain people and they have not been loyal to me. And it's very frustrating for some of the people around me when they see that happen to me. And for me, I, I said, you know, that is that person's chance to learn how to be a friend. They just haven't gotten there yet. They don't understand how much more special it would be if they were reciprocating the friendship I was showing them. Yeah. You know, and it makes it just even more rich. For, for all in, <laughs> it's a very interesting thing because I, you and I are solo acts. Yeah. And, uh, you have one duet you do. It's my favorite part of what you do is uh, the random show with Kevin. Literally has had a profound impact on my life. Oh, wow. A big part of why I lost 30 pounds this year. You were telling mm -hmm. me how good I looked. But yeah. I was in Italy a couple of summers ago, and you and Kevin were talking about Ozempic. Uh -huh. He had taken Ozempic and puked. And I went to my doctor, and I talked to them about Ozempic, like a TV commercial. And I haven't talked about this previously because I don't want to influence people. But I did a couple of you know, series of Ozempics along with fasting that I learned about from you and Kevin and using the zero fasting app, which I learned about from the show. And then I uh, obviously hear you talk about weightlifting and the impact that has. And so for the past year or so, I just did the Tim Ferriss, Kevin Rose program. I did a couple of cycles of Ozempic. I did the weightlifting and I did the intermittent fasting using the zero app and uh, yeah, I dropped 30 pounds. Yeah. You look great, man. Thank I you. said it before we started recording. I was like, you look really, really good. Well done. I'd like to get five or 10 more pounds of weight, oh, you know, of like muscle, uh, yeah. and then be able to run a marathon again. So if I get those two goals, I would be pretty happy. You can do it. You can definitely do it. I'm in the window. Yeah. So Solo Act suddenly decides, wait a minute, I want to be in a rock band, but I, I may not, not be allowed. not decide that actually. Got no. kind of pushed into it. <laughs> okay. I'm well, being honest. Right. So tell the story. Yeah. What happened was uh, Chamath. Yeah. Uh, and I had become friends. Shemath, I have and you should there. explain, and I, if no. people have no context, what is All In? What is the premise of the podcast? All In is a podcast with four friends who are all capital allocators. In other words, like venture capitalists, investors, and business builders. And I guess in all cases, four folks who are 50 years old with 30 years of business experience each. So that's about over 120 years building businesses or investing in them, uh, getting together and talking about business, and then whatever the topics of the day are. But everybody's a little unique and different. and it started as something we did in COVID because we would all play poker together. And four of the poker players eventually wound up doing this every week, this podcast. And this is in decade two of me podcasting. And so I kind of created a format that I modeled after the McLaughlin group, which was a Sunday morning show. Don't know it. So yeah, there's a guy McLaughlin. You can look up some tapes of it. Anyway, this guy McLaughlin was super cantankerous and he'd have like a, you know, a Republican, a Democrat, an independent, whatever, a young person, a Bostonian person, a California hippie, you know, whatever. And he was always cantankerous and moving the conversation along and he would say wrong and you know, do this. And it was like a very full contact kind of dynamic, interrupt each other conversation. Mm -hmm. But you, it, it just, I was always drew me in. It's the best Sunday morning political show of all time, the McLaughlin group. And so, Tremoth and I had known each other from AOL. He was working at AOL when I sold my company there, the, the blogging company back in the day. We had met, he became a venture capitalist, and then he met Mark Zuckerberg, and he was one of the first employees at Facebook, grew Facebook from 10 million to 800 million users or something crazy like that. He was responsible for the growth team. Super intelligent, considered fun, thoughtful guy, dynamic, aggressive, and, and just great leader of people. We became friends. We started playing cards together, joking, laughing. And I said, you know, I really would like to have you on my podcast. He wanted to be under the radar. He didn't want people to know who Chamath Palihapitiya was, but he came on the podcast. In a lot of ways, like Chris Saka did, our friend, mm -hmm. was one of the first people. I think I was one of the first people to actually have him on a podcast when I did my two-parter with him. Mm -hmm. So Chamath became a, a bit of a brand after he was on the podcast a couple of times. And then he keynoted a couple of events. And we just had this rapport. 
And the report came from just breaking chops and laughing at the poker game every week. And then people saw that report when we were on stage. And then he said to me one time when he was coming out of CNBC, you know, we should just do a podcast together. I was like, yeah, come on this week in startups. He said, no, no, I want to do a different type of thing, just me and you. And you, you know, you just bring up the news of the week. I talk about it. Then I ask you a question and then you talk about it. And we go back and forth, startups, public markets, SPACs, public, private. I was like, that's a really good idea. Sure. Let's do it. Um, and we started texting back and forth and what are you going to call it? And I was like, we should give like a poker thing since it's like poker, we should call it all in. And so the two of us started doing it, but this was during COVID. So then we're like, well, who knows about COVID? And um, Sachs had been doing a bunch of research on it. And he had bought ventilators and he had masks. So explain who Sachs is. So David Sachs is an old friend of mine who worked at PayPal with Peter Thiel, went to college with Peter Thiel, is a Republican, independent, really like um, chess club, debate club, brilliant product manager, created Yammer, sold to Microsoft for a billion dollars. Just really smart individual, but right, right leaning, like seriously right leaning, like writing articles, donating to people on the right. And we became close friends. Our families would go on vacation together, just, you know, as close of friends uh, as you could be. And then we had him on as a guest to talk about like, hey, what's going on with this Wuhan flu thing? And, you know, what's going on with Trump? And, you know, people were very scared and confused at the time. And then we had another friend who came to poker. I didn't have a big relationship with Freeberg at the time. I just knew him from poker. And David Freeberg, who runs uh, something called the Production Board, and he was an early Google employee, came on, and he actually is like, he created Climate.com and sold that to Monsanto, so he understands science like at a very deep level. And so all of a sudden, you know, this thing clicks, and then Robinhood and that whole AMC thing happened, and I was an investor in Robinhood, and we started talking about that, and the show just caught heat, and the dynamic between the four of us, people really started to like, and people were at home. Caught heat in a good way. I think caught heat in like, wow, this is really dynamic. They're smart, they're opinionated, and they're successful. And so when people see that you've made a lot of money is one thing I learned in my life. It's like the day before the Weblogs Inc. you know, sale, and then the day after when I had no money and then became a millionaire, people treated me incredibly different. Like all of a sudden I got like 30 more IQ points and I was two feet taller. I was like, (laughs) I'm the same guy, but like people would just take you a lot more seriously. Yeah. And it just is a really good thing to understand. Like literally if you inherited a billion dollars, people would think you're a genius. It's a big failing of (laughs) human nature that we have this weird thing with the scorecard that we think the the scorecard of dollars is like important. It's not. Long story short, all this stuff comes together and people, it seems to connect with people and it starts racing up the charts. And the last couple of weeks, I think we were number 24, 26, 27, you know, like just top 30 podcasts in the world. Gwyneth Paltrow wrote about it in her Hoop newsletter a couple of weeks ago that she's obsessed with the podcast, the personalities. And so, you know, This Week in Startups had millions of listeners every month and doing incredible five days a week, making millions of dollars in advertising. But it's a very niche thing. It's just about startups. So if you're in the startup space, like you would want to take a selfie with me. All in has crossed over in a way like you experience with the Tim Ferriss podcast and, you know, people who are pursuing excellence. It's a much wider aperture of people. Yeah. And so this thing just appeals to a lot of people. And it's literally people say it's like their Sunday morning ritual or their Saturday morning ritual. It's replaced the Sunday morning talk show. And it turns out Politico is writing some kind of a profile of us right now because Uh. it's become so influential in Washington because we talk about the economy, technology, and technology is obviously having a big impact on the economy and politics, whatever. So anyway, in some ways it's become a hit. Uh, It's very weird for me because, you know, I've had a couple of hits before, but this one also is bigger and I'm not in control of it. I have three partners and all three of my partners on it have never had a boss. So you've literally (laughs) got four of the most opinionated friends We've never had a boss who have four different directions they want to take it, and it is a bit chaotic. And I'm the producer of it as well, yeah. and you know, did all the work, came up with the format, etc. But objectively, you know, Chamath has a series of fans. Freeberg now has the stands. Sachs has the whole right wing. So it's like a super team has come together. Yeah, yeah. And it's very hard to keep a super team together for any period of time. And this thing has come off the rails famously like two or three times. Could you walk us through your favorite of those three times and how it was resolved? Well, uh, 
<laughs> I wanted to do an event because you mentioned before I like events. And I was like, let's do this all in <laughs> Summit. I'll do all the work. And uh, you guys show up. I have a production team. And, you know, here's what it will be. And one of the four of us was in a complete panic and complaining and arguing incessantly because he thought I was going to ruin their reputation because what if it's not great? The thing comes out of the gate. People are comparing it to the TED conference, saying this is better than Recode or better than TED and it's the new TED and whatever because we got the most incredible speakers in the world showed up for us. Just everybody. Uh, I had invited you. You didn't make it, but I'll get you next year. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know if I can afford your speaking fee. But... Uh, <laughs> If it makes you feel any better, I know, I remember this, and I have not done any speaking except for South by Southwest, I want to say in three or four years, yeah. So, but- No, there'll be some opportunity, we'll like, it'll be a fun thing for us to do. And in my own defense, I have been to events of yours before. I've gone to, yeah. I have spoken with you at, at events. So I couldn't make that one. Yes, you did one of mine. Yes. Okay. All right. So wait, where does the conflict come in? So the conflict came in that I just told him like, hey, listen, I'm working over here. <laughs> you need to shut the fuck up and let me just do my work and stop being in a panic attack all the time. And he's like, my reputation, this, that, what if it's bad? We pay, people paid 7,500 a ticket. I'm like, some people pay 7,500 a ticket for every event. Like, it's not a big deal. And then I um, gave half the tickets for scholarship for people. Anyway, we had this back and forth. And then I told the person like, you know, Freeberg, I was like, Freeberg, if you don't want to be on the show and you're complaining so much, I got Brad Gerstner over here. I love how he was anonymous up until right now. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, the good news is Freeberg and I, after this blowout, like many friendships, we actually are really enjoying our time together. But it was another one of these like stab you in the back, stab you in the face thing. You know, like you got the quote from Doug. I said, listen, if you're not enjoying your time on the All In podcast and you don't want to do the event, why don't you do 25 episodes a year? And I'll have Brad Gerstner who, come, who sits in when one of us is out as like the fifth Beatle. I'll have him do the other 25. We have this big fight and the whole thing's <laughs> going to explode. And then they're, you know, these two are going to do their own pockets, whatever. And then we all just sat down and we realized the audience fucking loves this. We love it. Let's not do any events. Let's not do any spin outs. Yeah. People wanted to do a TV show with us, you know, top networks, you know, all this stuff. And you understand how big the podcasting business now is better yeah. than anybody. You know, you got a top. 50 podcasts. These podcasts have become a very big business. On top of that, my biggest media success to date with my three partners refuse to do ads. Yeah. This is one I was hoping you would bring up. So, <laughs> so yeah. Let's, so let's... I'm sitting here on <laughs> arguably $25 million in advertising, which I would get a fourth of. And they're like, Sachs is like, well, I'm already rich and I got a plane. And Tremont's like, well, I got a plane. I'm already rich. I don't need a, I don't need advertising. I'm like, I'll read the ads. I'll sell the ads. They're like, no, it's like, why would it's so cheap to have an ad? And I'm like, no, it's not. It's like every, everybody's got ads. I'll, it's just an ad. People listen to the ad. They drink some athletic greens. Athletic greens is healthy for you. <laughs> we're, we're done here. Like, who, who doesn't love athletic greens? Like, we're good. You know, like, yeah. sorry to give athletic greens. <laughs> use use the promo great. code Tim, not J Cal. <laughs> use Tim, not twist. Oh, I love AJ. I was just texting with uh, the CEO, Chris, like, 45 minutes ago. You know, I had it this weekend. I, I made a really good uh, ginger, some other juices. I know people drink with water, but I like a little juice. Yeah. And uh, what I do is now I use half the amount of athletic greens, but I do it twice a day. I, I kind of like to space out my athletic greens. I like the right ginger now. idea. Slightly different. But the ginger, when you when you blend that ginger, you have that spicy, mm, yummy, yummy. But your partners were not buying the the ginger cocktail no. pitch. So literally, like I could use another seven million a year. You know, like this is <laughs> this is big cash, like six or seven million. That's a lot of fucking money. Well, after taxes, it would be a jet. Yeah. yeah. So no, I have no jet. <laughs> <laughs> this episode is gonna get clipped like crazy. So I'm like, guys, <laughs> let me have a jet. You're standing between me and private aviation. <laughs> I'm being a little facetious right now. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. You know, it's not exactly facetious. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I just said, you know what? I'm not going to try to monetize this anymore. We're not going to do live events. It causes too much chaos. Let's just do it every week. And then I'm raising my next venture fund, Launch 4. And I decided to raise it publicly. You can, mm -hmm. if you pick a designation 506C, you can say I'm raising a fund. So I said, guys, would it be okay if on the podcast I mention I'm raising a fund and people can email me, jason at calacanis.com. Boom. All of a sudden, I get a thousand emails. People are like, oh, yeah, I'm a rich person. I would love to be an investor in your fund. 
I do five webinars. I really hope the emails read <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Basically, like it's like, oh, hi, J. Cal. I'm a huge fan of All In. I, you know, my family office, I went to this, yeah, we right, saved the right. whales, and we right, love, right. we have big fans of the pod. Translation to 140 characters, I'm rich, can you make me richer? <laughs> Basically, and so, I kid you not, I do five webinars the last five weeks, $44 million in commitments Whoa. from people I have never met. My last fund was $44 million. I have not done an in-person meeting yet, so I said, you know what? Now listen, for people listening, in the venture fund, I have to deploy that money, triple it, and then I get 25% of it. I don't get the 44 million. It's not a donation. It's like what I do for a living. But holy cow, I was like, I don't need to have the ads on it. Yeah. I can just play the long game and raise a larger venture fund and meet a bunch more of these LPs or whatever. But every LP meeting I have, or most meetings I have now, start with, hey, can I take a selfie? And this is my favorite thing about All In. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, yeah. I had to come to peace with the fact, all four of us, that we hit lightning in a bottle. Yeah. That's number one. Number two, we have to trust and love each other and put on a good show and we have to be rooting for each other. And I said to everybody, like, if we're going to do this, let's be rooting for each other. And that means when you're having this debate and you disagree with me and like Sachs and I have had blowout battles over like <laughs> Ukraine. Yeah. And I'm like, listen, Putin needs to be stopped. And he's like, you know, Biden and these people are tempting a nuclear war. This is a very important debate. Yeah. And it gets very heated. And, you know, people think Sax and I hate each other. Sax and I love each other deeply, even though he can't say it. I can say I love Sax and I know he loves me. <laughs> and what I hope happened from that podcast is people see that, you know, we can have a, a brawl, still love each other, still respect each other, and still make forward progress and learn from each other. And, you know, Sax is right about a lot of the things with Ukraine. Mm -hmm. We should have maybe tried for peace earlier. A lot of the things he said actually turned out to be right. Now it seems like Biden is saying to Zelensky, maybe you guys can start working on negotiations now and maybe we won't give you an unlimited supply of support. Like we're giving you the weapons. Can you please sit down and try to work this out? But it has created chaos. And because the podcast is so popular, Tim, mm -hmm. it's, it's like a lot of things, like people maybe give it a little too much credit. You start to have a very big responsibility. Now it's become a responsibility. And that, exactly, you nailed it. That's what yeah. I was thinking. Like, now people are calling me saying, hey, you got to get Sachs in line. And then people are calling Sachs saying, oh, J. Cal hates Trump. He's got Trump derangements. I mean, everybody is projecting into this while we're just having a conversation. Like, hey, what gives you the right to have a conversation about Ukraine? What gives you a right to have a conversation about affirmative action in this Harvard case, right? What gives you the right to talk about masks and COVID? And what I tell people is when we talk about things in our wheelhouse, capital allocation, company formation, the markets, take notes. We're experts, totally awesome. We've been at it for over a century combined. Great place for you to learn if you wanted to be a venture capitalist, entrepreneur, or bet on the markets. Totally get it. When we talk about anything else, COVID, Ukraine, politics, we're as informed as you, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. You're listening to four people have a conversation. Go do your own research. Go find your own truth. And what we found with COVID specifically, which was kind of ironically where this whole thing started and what caused it to start, Fannie Fair and ProPublic, I don't know if you saw this, are like, yeah, we intercepted some communications. It looks like it was probably a lab leak. Yeah. And we were sitting here 18 months ago and when different people on the podcast were saying, well, maybe it's a lab leak, they were like, well, we have to take that podcast down now. Yeah. We, we can't have that conversation that it's a lab leak. Like, yeah, there's two labs in the world that are studying the Wuhan virus. And one of them is where the leak happened. I mean, one of them is the one where COVID happened and it happens to be in Wuhan. Like there's 10,000 locations in the world, like pretty easy jump to make, but there's some weird thing going on right now where people expect Tim Ferriss or Joe Rogan or David Sachs can't have a conversation and talk about a topic because their shows are popular. Yeah. Yeah. And we have to work this out because you are allowed to have a conversation and people need to come to their own truth. And yeah. sometimes institutions do a great job. Sometimes they fail us. But we should all debate these issues. If it's helpful, I can tell you my policy on this stuff. Please tell me. Or I say my protocol. My protocol is if I'm going to talk about something that I know is going to light people up, but that it is important. And I feel like I have maybe access to an expert who can actually speak credibly. Mm -hmm. 
then I'll add in very strong disclaimers, and then I will not look yes. at Twitter for at least a week. <laughs> <laughs> yes, some self-care. It's very simple. It's like, if you don't want the cock punches, don't go to where everyone's giving cock punches. Ouch my balls. Like, literally yeah. like Idiocracy, the TV show, Ouch My Balls. Like, you're going to get your nuts kicked yeah, yeah. over and over and over again. <laughs> Just for having a conversation. I think, I thought yeah. Joe Rogan did a really good job when they were like, hey, you're having these people on, they have uncertain whatever. And he's like, I'm a comedian. And I'm like, yeah, you're yeah. a comedian with 10 million or 20 million viewers. Yeah. And he's like, you know what? If I get it wrong, tell me who to have on. I'll do it again. But again, I'm a comedian interviewing people and trying to learn. And I, I, I actually think there's a little bit of responsibility on the audience's part here. There is. However, I'm going to push back a little bit. Okay, yeah, let's go. I have decline or through vetting disqualify probably 80% of the people that might be on the show because I do a lot of fact checking ahead of time. And I will do scientific fact checking, reference checking. Mm. And if it seems like someone is playing it too fast and loose, they do not come on the show, generally speaking. So yeah. I do a lot of heavy lifting on the front end, which if if someone's goal is to learn and they're not a domain expert, I think is incumbent upon them if they have a large audience. And I'm not saying Joe doesn't do that, but I do think. Well, he said he doesn't do it. He said, I don't oh, well, come in go. prepared. He, yeah. Just to, to be clear, when this whole thing blew up, he said, I want to let you know, I do not come in prepared. Sometimes I just have like somebody hands me notes. He said, and I'm thinking about changing that. So I do think if he's going to talk about like medical stuff, he should have a researcher do some stuff yeah. and then i mean I, you're a very close friend of mine and like yeah i know you do research yeah. i mean but also i've got 20 pages of notes which is why when you talk about whatever topic you're talking about the audience has an expectation that it's going to be tight when people go into joe rogan they should have the expectation that he just walked in unprepared or modestly prepared so that's that's where like i think audiences have to take some responsibility it's, it's probably between the two things we're talking it's about between here, the right? two and you know i yeah. think that and he might not want to do this, but you know, if Joe wanted to do something preemptively, it's just like at the very heading of the show, there could be sort of a, a disclaimer of the yes. kind of disclaimer you'd see on Jackass back in the day, which would be like, yes. hey, these are trained professionals. This is for entertainment. Yes. And do your own homework. Actually, I have an idea for Joe Rogan. All right. I think he should start a second podcast. It'll make tens of millions of dollars called after Joe. Okay. And it should be a group of experts vetting whatever was talked about or goofing uh, on it. Just That's a great idea. It would just be like a breakdown of what happened on the episode. And then he could say, listen, yeah. Did you listen to after Joe or post Joe? Post Joe wrote a webpage. Like you do great notes. And there's people who do show notes of both of our shows once in a while that are pretty good. He should just pay somebody a thousand bucks to do a show notes. The thing yeah. makes so much money. Pay, pay three people $2,000 each. Just spend five grand on like, yeah. this is a medical episode, vet it, put a bunch of links in it. That would just make it so much better, right? Yeah. I think. So I have a question since I did call you podcast master in the beginning <laughs> and I want to I want to put on a showcase for a moment. So you and I have, have offline talked, well, I guess it's probably online, but offline meaning non-publicly. Yeah talked about how you prepare privately. <laughs> Jesus. What am I? Am I a writer? I used to be. <laughs> words. Use your words, Ferris, <laughs> privately. So You're a great writer. We've talked about your moderating. I think you are yeah. one of the best moderators I've ever Aww. seen. And it's true. And I, that is absolutely, I would say that to anyone. I think I'm actually pretty sure I have said it publicly. You have actually. Thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. And I'd like to look at the mechanics and the preparation that goes into that. Mm. Because yeah. you've talked to me about this, and I remember one of the examples, again, which is hyper-specific, which is if you guys are on Zoom, which most people are not going to see, like raising your, your hand and using yeah. visual cues for things. So could you walk through what the preparation process looks like for a good episode? We build a docket every week for All In. The docket... I took from Red Scare, which is like this dirtbag left podcast of mm -hmm. these two women who live in the Dime Square in New York. All right. They're quite charming and hilarious. I, probably a little cutting edge for some people. But anyway, the Red Scare podcast is hilarious. And 
Dash always says, oh, what's on the docket? And I have a docket. Like, you know, these are the people who are, <laughs> we're going to pass judgment on, like before, before a judge. So we have a docket. I make a docket every week with my producer, Nick. And basically we're in a group chat and whatever links we share that week, we put in there. And then we put bullet points. So the docket is a Google Doc. Yeah, Google Doc of topics. And then this is put into a private Slack channel that you guys use or something like yeah. that? Okay. Yeah, we're on Signal. Yeah, And so Signal, we, we right. yeah, that's where they all disappear within a week. Hard lessons to learn. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for getting it. Yeah. So anyway, Signal. You can reach me on Signal. <laughs> so now, do you use desktop client for that to make it easier to use or do you do it all on mobile? Signal is desktop and mobile now. Yeah, it's pretty great. And it's not owned by the Russians. Do you use mobile? I use mobile and I use a desktop, yeah. Okay, great. Anyway, I have the bullet points in there and I will sometimes push people to come up with topics. So like, hey, when Friedberg was kind of sitting back a lot in the episodes, I kind of dubbed him the Sultan of Science and I kind of created this character and I said, you know, listen, you're, you're kind of like a little bit of a wallflower last episode. Can you give me whatever the most interesting science story of the week is? And if I don't get one by, you know, whatever a day before taping, I'm like, hey, and maybe I'll do a little research myself. Hey, what do you think of this? Or what about that? And when I get a science topic out of him, I throw to him and, you know, he just lights up. It's great. And then, you know, Chamath will make a joke or Sax will go check his email. And then for <laughs> Sax, I throw him red meat. So like the red meat for Sax is like anything political, anything to do with the constitution, <laughs> anything to do with the Supreme Court or legal cases. And then if I want to give uh, an alley-oop to Chamath, so I think about it as the moderator, I got to get out of this guy I got to get him engaged, Freeberg. I got to give him some science so that he gets excited, right? Mm -hmm. He's not excited to talk about politics because he doesn't like it. With Sachs, I got a tiger. Yeah. And all, or like, a, like a fierce tiger. And if I throw, you know, a couple of chickens out there, he's going to maul them. And I know <laughs> what they are. So I'm like, okay, here you go. Supreme Court decision. He loses his mind. Oh, here you go. Biden said this and it's inconsistent. Or boom. Hey, here's something with Trump. He's going to just go crazy. So now you got your lion going crazy. You got your science nerd coming out of his shell. And then with Chamath, <laughs> it's more like an alley-oop. Sweaters. Sweaters. <laughs> Laura Piana. <laughs> Conspicuous consumption. No, it really is more about markets and startups. And for him, I like to say to him, can you explain this financial topic and why people are talking about interest rates are bad for tech companies. Why would the interest rate have any impact on that? Now, I know the answer to that, but he can actually explain it better than anybody on the squad. Yep. So what I'm doing there as the point guard is like, I have a clear path to the basket. I can just lay it in and do the layup. Mm -hmm. But I see him out of the corner of my eye and I'm like, you know what would make the audience have a better experience? Is if I pretend I'm gonna do the layup and then from behind my back, I throw it up to him and he slam dunks it. Right. And so I've, I've learned with each of them how to feature them and make them really their best selves. And then behind the scenes, you know, when you see the point guard in basketball, like take somebody and they whisper in their ear something, I very quietly give them notes on their performance. And this is after each episode? After or? each show. I did it, had to do it more earlier. And then yeah. sometimes I'll do it in the group chat, if I think it's something everybody can benefit from, but more often than not, I'm doing it quietly. Yep. And so I, you know, I had to say to Freeberg, listen, you know, you don't say a lot about politics, but I think your opinion actually represents a large portion of the audience. And although you hate it, I think you expressing a little bit is going to be fine. And if you're not happy with how it comes out, and I think it's putting you at risk, I will tell you and we can cut it from the show. And once I gave him that sort of like, I think a little bit of a clear lane and encouragement, you will hear him talk a little bit more about politics, not to the extent Sachs does. And then I had to tell Sachs, hey Sachs, when, when I ask you something or I challenge you, I am not disagreeing with you. I'm helping you clarify your position or helping the audience understand your position more. That's a very, very smart way to put it. And you are attacking me telling me I'm watching MSNBC and I get my information from Rachel Maddow, I, I didn't ask you to explain. Like one time I said, just to be clear, Putin invaded Ukraine, not Biden, correct? Mm. And he just went off or whatever. And I said, you know, the reason I'm asking you that is because the audience thinks and the feedback online is you're a Putin apologist. It would help your position if you said to the audience, 
Putin and Putin alone is responsible for invading Ukraine. Now, how we manage Putin and his unjust, immoral invasion is, you know, up to us, right? Yeah. And that's what we can debate. But I'm trying to save him from being misunderstood, <laughs> right? And You're so, like one part moderator, one part coach, one part comms director. <laughs> Well, in a way, I'm not saying that is a bad thing. It's just no, like, no, no. I think it's super accurate. Yeah, you're helping everybody. What I realized yeah. was I've done. You and I have done, you know, hundreds of interviews with people. Great, it's awesome. We're both interested in people and learning from them and having great conversations. But this became something different for me. You know, mm. like being the orchestrator of the action. Oh, it's a different skill. Different skill. It was a totally different scale. And, you know, I had done these moderations before at events, but I, and I had sometimes done round tables, news round tables, but a lot of times I was one of the featured players, not the point guard, right? May I give one example of why they're totally different? In a one-on-one -on -one conversation, you can have a guest who monologues. If you have a group of people, that can be a huge problem. How do you deal with that specifically? Yeah, it's two techniques. Yeah. Two techniques. Very good. So you and I like technique. So the two techniques I have, one of them, is I say to people beforehand, great job on the show today. At this moment in time, you made four really great points. It would have been better if you made your first one or two and then said, I'm really interested in what Sachs thinks of that. Or I'm curious, Sachs, what you think. And then you have those two, just write them on a piece of paper there. There'll be time for those two. We'll circle back around. But now it doesn't look like you're taking all the chips off the table. Because in a conversation, with four smart people about a topic, there might be five good points to make. All four people might understand all five points or four of the points. And then if somebody comes in and they're just like, you know, ding, 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 ding. I just took all the good points. Yeah. There's nothing left for anybody else to do. And so you want to share the ball a little bit. You took two good points. You let somebody else make a good point. Yeah, you could have made that point. It was an obvious one, but you let somebody else have. It's a little bit generous as a performer. So it'd yep. be like, you know, you, you got some incredible guitar player they come out and they just do a solo of six minutes. And you're like, <laughs> piano guy could have done a solo for a minute. You could have done two. We could have given the drummer a minute and we could have let the vocalist lead off the song with an acapella, you know, moment, right? Yeah. And so I've really tried to be better at it and specifically tried to be better at it because people have been critical of me mm. for interrupting certain people. Huh. And so I had to actually adapt to that because certain people, if you interrupt them, it's a trigger for them. Yeah. Or it can break their train of thought. I ran into this recently and I was like, I was, well, I wondered how, like, how would Jason handle this? I was curious. So I came up with another one. I said, I'm going to give you the circle. So if people aren't watching right now, I'm just taking my index finger and I'm just giving the wrap up sign, but I'm also nodding. So I'm saying, yeah, mm, good stuff. You know, I'm giving you the good stuff, but like, hey, let's wrap that point. And then I'll just stop. And they finish their thought. And the other thing I do is I just use, okay. And I got that from Sam Harris. I was listening to the Sam's podcast. He gets people monologuing. These are some of the most brilliant academics in the world on his show. And you'll see sometimes he wants to break in, but I think in academia, it's even more like <laughs> difficult to do that. And he just Verboten, said, yeah. Verboten, that's the word I was looking for. <laughs> My dyslexia was killing me on that one. I was like, for written? <laughs> forbode. It's forbode, right? Yeah, you let yeah. people finish. But he'll say, okay. And it's like, okay, I got it. Okay, you did it. And then the person's like, oh, oh, Sam has something to add. And, yeah, and that's yeah. in a one-on-one -on -one situation. So, you know, you, you get good by studying. You know, I, I study a lot of what you do. And, I, you know, you have a way when you're asking a question of slowing down. And it's almost as if you're bringing us into your brain for the formation of the question. And I, I, that was me imitating you. <laughs> yeah, I figured, yeah. And when you do it, it's like somebody at a dinner party who's talking in a lower voice and everybody leans in. Mm. I know it's gonna be a fucking important question when you do that. Mm. And I don't know if you've, it's unconscious or it's conscious. Yeah. Or you are truly forming the question. But when listening to Tim Ferriss, when Tim slows down and Tim is thinking, I want to ask you one more question. Mm. I have it on this note here. It's, hold on. Now, 
it means it's a really important <laughs> question. And it really does work as a technique. And it, you know, everybody's techniques doesn't have to work for everybody. Like I talk fast. Yeah. You talk a little slower, more methodically. Sam talks even, you know, more monotone. He speaks in finished prose. Unless it's about Trump, and then he gets yeah, on tilt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is funny how we all study each other, right? It's like, oh, yeah. I love doing it. I mean, I remember doing so much studying in the beginning. I'm still studying. Me too. And it's fun to notice because when you're in the game and you're doing a lot of interviewing, I don't do as much moderating, so I can't speak to that. But you begin to notice, just like you noticed, you begin to notice the little things that were you not also doing a lot of reps, you wouldn't pick up. No. And it's about the reps, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about moderators. So you mentioned the McLaughlin group earlier. Are there any people who stand out as good moderators to you? You know, there's not a big cohort of moderators. Yeah, there aren't that many. I mean, you might say, what's his name from politically incorrect? Bill Maher. So Bill Maher, you know, he can drop something funny into a moderated bit. So two people are talking. And, uh, you know, I, I do a little comedy on the side and will sometimes make jokes during the podcast. Mm -hmm. And I have seen him do this particularly well. He's watching two people spar and he's kind of set that up and he's leaning back. Then he just lets like a little funny thing out. So as a device for a moderator, it's getting superheated. And then you drop something funny and you'll see me do this on All In. It kind of just cracks the whole thing open. Everybody's like, okay, that was getting really serious but we're all humans and we can laugh too about it. Yeah. So somebody's having some crazy debate about like Roe v. Wade and then he makes some joke, you know, and you're just like, whoa, that's a funny joke. Oh, I can laugh about Roe v. Wade and abortion. Oh my God, I'm not allowed to laugh about that. Like, yeah, that's a dicey place to be, but that comedic interruption is, it works pretty well. But there aren't many people or shows that do it well. Yeah. I think you you could pull it off. I think with, you know, you have your great rapport with Kevin Rose. Yeah. And if you got one or two more, you could do your own little all-in McLaughlin group thing. It would be quite successful, I think. Yeah, I guess it comes down to the the chemistry, like you, like you said, because with Kevin, it's like we just, it's like having a good improv comedy partner or something. It's like your styles yeah. just work for for some reason. Yes. And then you can always improve the craft and work on it, but there is just this baseline of compatible chemistry. You know, when you look at your podcast player, if I see random show, that's just like, I snipe that immediately. Like when the random <laughs> show comes up in my feed, because you know what? We were going back to friendship. We talked, well, we kind yeah. of spent a little time in this conversation. Friendship is so special, right? Like yeah. it's like one of those very special things in the world's unique. And when people see friendship, like true friendship, it's so, it's such a like intoxicating thing yeah. to know that you and Kevin are having a great time catching up. And we get yeah. to be there for it. It's just, to, and, then, and I do think that is a big part of why people have become addicted to All In. And we had like one or two weeks we took off. And man, I have never had people I'm so depressed. I'm so, oh God, what's going on? What's it? And then when the show was going to break up, and, oh my God, what's going on? And <laughs> this is, sucks, man. I, people wrote me very long notes. Like, you know, I really think you guys need to think about the fans and what the impact this is going to have on us. And I was like, <laughs> I feel like we're in Pink Floyd and like Roger Waters and Gilmore are like doing de separate tours. And they're like, it's the same songs, folks. Like, <laughs> you could just listen to the old albums. I think there's another piece which is right parallel to this. And that is with friendship. With friendship on display, you get to hear people also talking as humans without overly self-censoring in a world where that has become the norm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. No, when we had our, just now in our conversation, when we were bringing up Ouch My Balls from Theocracy, <laughs> I was like, oh, we're going there? Hmm, no, are we going to get canceled for liking a funny bit in a movie? <laughs> yeah. And and I mean, the fact of the matter is, as... Uh, I don't think anyone will disagree. Like if anyone listening to this podcast had their group chats publicly shared, everything would be over, right? It's just like their chats with their five closest friends. All Oof. of us would be unmasked yeah. for the complete children that we all are. Yes. And yes. goofballs. Despite that, given the times, I think the majority of folks feel like they have to have to put on a mask and stuff all of that so far down because the risk seems so high. So when you have a show where friends mm -hmm. are having fun, they're not taking themselves or anything too seriously, even though they do mm -hmm. take things seriously in life. Right. It's 
allows everyone to just exhale for a second. Yeah, chill out. Take off okay. the psychological corset that they strain to put on in the morning, you know? It's very weird, like, being a Gen Xer, where, like, the Overton window was so much wider when we were young. And now the Overton window, people are like, close it tighter, close it tighter. And I'm like, who cares? Just a window. Like, you can yeah. pick how wide or open you want it to be, but people are really trying to, like, narrow the topics you can discuss in a way that I find kind of a bummer. Yeah. You know, because all those conversations are still going to occur. They're just going to occur in private. Yeah. I almost would rather they be occurring publicly so we could make more progress as a society. Yeah. I agree. It feels like it's going to work against us. I, I hope it opens up. That's why I was talking about that Red Scare podcast or another podcast I like is um, the guy who wrote uh, Less Than Zero and uh, American Psycho, uh, Brett Easton Ellis. Oh, yeah. And both of these are on Patreon and both of these are behind paywalls, uh -huh. which I think is interesting. Yeah. Both of them are podcasts where people are being an overturn window that's twice as wide open. Just for folks who are listening, if they don't know Overton window, can you just check the definition? What's allowable to discuss in society writ large? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, even though I'm using a fancy word, what you're allowed to talk about in society without feeling ashamed or that you're being inappropriate. Or that you're going to be persecuted or canceled. Or persecuted, for sure. So there was a time when, you know, just even talking about somebody being a homosexual was outside the Overton window. And if you brought it up, everybody would leave the dinner party and be aghast. Oh, my God. So you had to just like treat a person who was a gay person at a dinner party as like, oh, they, yes, they've got a roommate, you know, and like, we're just going to sweep that under the rug. Like they're, oh yeah, they're here with their roommate. They split their rent because it's cheaper. Yeah. And then you could be like, yeah, Ernie and Bert are gay. They're roommates. <laughs> Pretty obvious. I like the little judo movie did with the Ernie and Bert there, like <laughs> jelly and peanut butter. I was like, well, wait a second. Oh, wow. I'm just now, now I'm it's okay. Yeah, I like it. I like it. <laughs> yeah. So you have this experience with these friends. You build this podcast. Yeah. Two questions that you can pick either or both. The first is you mentioned capturing lightning in a bottle. And I'd be curious how you would explain the success of this show. Because there must be, you are so deliberate, so deliberate. You, every example you've given, I think from at least your earlier career, shows how systematic and methodical you are. So I don't, mm. I know it wasn't an accident. It may, have, it may have coalesced in a way that couldn't have been predicted, but I don't think it was an accident. So how would you, how would you explain the popularity? Like what are the ingredients? Yeah. And then secondly, how do you now think about success for yourself? Mm. And you, you made that joke earlier about being separated from the, you know, the private jet, your friends standing in the way of this private jet. Jet blockers. Yeah, yeah. How do you think, <laughs> how do you think about success and or power? Because that played such a role in your life up to this point. So the ingredients that made the podcast successful or that make it successful, and then the, the success power piece. I think there is something that comes from, you know, repetition and getting reps in uh, you and I are both big fans of that. And so I think having done, you know, whatever at the time, maybe 13 or 1400 episodes of this week in startups and all those events interviews, I came into all in with a 10 person podcasting team. I mean, that includes some salespeople, so whatever, but having had done so many podcasts that I came in with so much knowledge and ability and it was like, Oh, my skill set, but a different playing field. It would be like somebody who plays ping pong all of a sudden gets on a tennis court, which happened to me. I used to play ping pong as a kid. I bought a house that has a tennis court quite embarrassingly. Like it's like a mind blowing thing for a kid from Brooklyn to have a tennis court on their property. You're like, wait, aren't there like two in for 10,000 people in Brooklyn <laughs> and you have to wait like to get on it. And then I have one where I can just sit there and like let it go unused for a month. Like ping pong and tennis is the same thing. There's a, yeah. there's a net, there's a ball, there's, you put spin on it. And I started taking tennis lessons this year and it was like, Ooh, you know, your brain kind of lights up. Yeah, yeah. Same thing, but different game yeah. skill. So I think that it was like all that preparation had led to this new thing that you actually keyed off on. And we talked about last year for like an hour during the winter of like, Hey, what happened there? And so I think that's, that was the lightning in the bottle for me personally was I, maybe I'm a better moderator than an interview. Maybe that actually was sitting there the whole time. Maybe I'm a better, yeah. ten, better tennis player than a ping pong player. So that for me, I think has opened up a lot of possibility of what mm -hmm. I, possibilities of what I could do with the last 
10, 20, 30, 40 years, whatever I got left on this planet uh, before yeah. the tears and the rain moment happens. And so it has opened my aperture a bit and I am thinking about things differently, which dovetails with your second question, which is after I made, you know, whatever amount of millions of dollars, I had a profound realization. Like when I go out to eat with a friend who's a billionaire, me, you and Travis were sitting around or me, you and Matt Mullenweg were sitting around and we took out our net worth and it was like, oh my God, like you and I are down here. These two guys are up here. <laughs> we all go and have a steak. Steak tastes the same. Yeah, we all yeah. go and go skiing or we go to Japan, same experience. And once I realized that, I was like, for me, it might be different for other people. The scorecard of cash doesn't matter yeah. beyond a certain point. And for me, it was the freedom to do whatever I want in my life and to take care of my three daughters, take care of my wife and be a good provider, take care of my extended family if they need it, some help on the margins. And once that happened, I was like, I actually, I drive a Model Y and I prefer that to the Plaid and I have a Model X. Like I enjoy sometimes the New York Strip better than Wagyu. I just kind of like the flavor of it. It's a fifth of the price. So once you start to realize like, okay, this is these are just constructs and money is just not the right scorecard. Yeah. The right scorecard is, did you wake up and couldn't get, couldn't wait to get out of bed? Like to me, yeah. that's the true scorecard. I cannot wait to get on air and do this week in startups with Molly and talk about tech. Can't wait to meet with founders. I can't wait to teach another course on how to start a company. Can't wait to see my friends for dinner. Can't wait to help my friends if they're in need. Can't wait to come on the Tim Ferriss podcast. If I can't wait to do the activity, I know I'm doing something right. You, when you yeah. invited me on, I went to Jade. I was like, my wife's name is Jade. And I was like, oh, you know, Tim invited me on the podcast. I can't wait to do it. Like, and I have never, that, that very rarely happens. But I was like, you know, I listen to the Tim Ferriss podcast all the time. And I'm sure at some point I'll be on it. But the act of doing it with you to me was like, oh, I'm excited, you know? And being excited and enthusiastic to me, it just means something has aligned. Yeah. You know, when I'm writing, you and I have the same thing. I don't know where it is for you, but somewhere around like a third of the book, things start heating up for me. Mm -hmm. And like you all of a sudden, like you know, the, the first third of the book is like, oh, and then all of a sudden, oh, yeah, I know what sections I have to do. I can see behind the next corner. The book just flows and you're like, boom, 2000 words are coming out at a clip. You know, like those kind of moments when you have that flow and you have that enthusiasm for life. Yeah. You have to construct the life around those. Mm. And then life is just pulling you out of bed every day and just telling you like, oh, I got to go to bed. Like every night I go to bed and I'm just like, mm, I don't want to close my eyes. I want to just do another hour. <laughs> it's hard for me to go to bed some nights because my enthusiasm is so high for life. And, you know, it wasn't always that way. A lot of it was a struggle. A lot of it was trying to figure out who I was. But I really do want to enjoy this last couple of decades of if there's an interesting project or moment that's going to create that great memory and going to make me enthusiastic, I want to do it. Yeah. And if, you know, that means helping out a friend on a special project or, you know, going on a friend's podcast or whatever, doing a new podcast. It's, it's just, I feel very blessed that I got here and I want to just squeeze every single drop of juice out of that, you know, box of oranges. <laughs> really, I mean, think about it. Our friend Dave Goldberg, rest in peace, you know, Tony Shea, yeah. the darkness there. Like it can be over and it can be it's exactly like our age range where we start saying goodbye to people. Yep. And so if you're in your 20s or 30s, like you're just on adrenaline and then you get to 40s and 50s and you're like, huh, what do I do with what's left? Especially if some things have hit for you, you know, like if you're mm -hmm. Tim Ferriss and like you got to really start thinking like, okay, well. I'm one of the top podcasters in the world, one of the top authors in the world. Is this actually making me happy? Yeah. Right? And that's the thing I'm writing in my new book about is, you know, my new book is about money and wealth. Mm -hmm. And- um, Can't wait to read it. I want to send you some early stuff and get your thoughts on it. But I'm writing about this paradox that you and I are talking about right now, which is what happens when you catch the car? Yeah. What happens? You know, it's, it's, it's part, how do you catch the car? But then once I get you on the hook for that, like, how do you get the money? Now what happens when you have caught the car? And then yeah. now you have to look in the mirror. I caught the car. Look at the adrenaline rushes over. What, am I actually happy? Did I want to catch that car? Yeah. Did I want to be Tim Ferriss? Did I want to be J. Cal? Did I want to be Travis? Did I want to be Matt Mullenweg? Yeah. Is this actually making me happy? What now?
And that's yeah. where like Buddhism and a lot of like soulfulness has hit me in my fifties or, you know, right before my forties, basically when my two friends died, two of my poker buddies died and it just, it just reprogrammed my brain in a major way, yeah. you know, uh, those two events. And it's actually been a gift, you know, in a way, because now I just look at the world differently. It's like, a, it's a big gift. Puts things in perspective. Yeah. I mean, it does really. Yeah. And, you know, another pattern I've noticed just with respect to catching the car is that not everyone, but a lot of, a lot of achievers I know who have been driven enough and worked hard enough and focused long enough and sacrificed enough to make a lot of money when they finally cross that threshold where they're, where they, they can't really rationalize the need to make more. Right. Which, by the way, I mean, <laughs> not to plug my own, I haven't done this. I haven't mentioned the four-hour work week in a long time. But if you actually read some of the basics, the fundamentals in that book, it outlines just how much self-deception goes into believing that you need 20, 30, 50, 100 million dollars. It's mostly unjustifiable. Totally. And when you get enough money that you've won the game you always thought would answer your prayers and remove all the pain, anxiety and depression and it doesn't. Yeah. That is a oh, terrifying boy. moment. And yep. oh my god, do people and I'll include myself in this group of people, yeah. begin to panic because you're like, wait a second, if that didn't fix these things, yep. what will? What in the fuck am I supposed to do? And uh, it can be, and you know, I don't want to make it a complete swan song. I mean, look, it's, it's better to, all things being equal, to have the money than to not have the money. However, yeah. the prevalence of depression in quote unquote, successful people that has increased rather than decreased after they catch the car is it's worth studying. I think it tells us a lot about the human condition, even if you never end up catching the car. Yeah. And this is where doing the work internally. And I really respect the fact that you've used, you know, some of the, the resources you've gathered to do what the work you're doing at psychedelics. Yeah, thank you. I've never publicly talked about the psychedelic work or psychedelics period because I, you know, as a person who sometimes people follow what I do, you know, with a fan base, like yeah. I, I talked about like actually taking Ozempic for the first time. I think there's things, there's suffering in the world that psychedelics are uniquely qualified, I suspect. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you, you'd want to talk to a doctor and a therapist and do these things in a very considered fashion. But the fact that you're you know, uh, looking at psilocybin and other people are looking at ayahuasca or other ketamine or whatever. I think the research and the suffering that's happening, a lot of it is because people have not done enough of the work to look inside yeah, and find out where that trauma is and maybe try and clear it and maybe try to understand it. And that is, I think, the breakthrough that's going to happen in our lifetime because of people like you and some other friends of ours who have dedicated significant resources towards the study of these. So I don't know if you saw Colorado, I think, passed I did. Yeah. 122 yesterday. Yeah, it's big news. Very big news. Big news. Colorado is going to allow therapists to do all these different psychedelics in really safe settings with really qualified people for people who have PTSD, people who have trauma, people who have anxiety, people who have been to wars, people whose lives have been wars. And uh, it's having a profound impact. And if people are out there and they're suffering, you know, I, I really, really encourage them to go to therapy and to, you know, maybe even research this stuff uh, because again, you, you give these disclaimers all the time on this podcast, but there is help out there yeah. and you don't need to suffer alone. And sometimes people will mask their suffering and mask their problems with performance. And this is the show about performance. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why people listen to it and people are drawn to it. But sometimes we're drawn to performance because we don't want to face the pain or suffering that is driving that performance, the fuel, you know, like yeah. a lot of times those hot coals that are burning, that's a lot of pain and suffering. Yeah. And uh, it fuels an engine, a mighty engine. Yeah. But, you know, then you get to the destination like we're talking about here and then, hey, maybe this isn't serving me well anymore. Right. And you want it to serve you well, you know. Yeah, agreed. And I'll make just a couple of recommendations for folks one, this is this is an extremely heavy podcast in terms of content, but if people are curious in 
the capacity of researching psychedelic therapies or psychedelic assisted therapies, but also looking at alternatives to that. Uh, I did do a podcast that people can find at tim.blog slash trauma, which is a conversation between myself and Debbie Millman, it's incredible. who suffered from uh, horrible childhood abuse. And we took very different paths, but found solace, found support in very, very different ways. And there are re a lot of resources associated with the blog post in the show notes that people can, can look at. The other, if people are interested in identifying at least some of the credible institutions and scientists doing research on, say, complex PTSD and MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, which is now, I believe, through phase three, and psilocybin for treatment-resistant depression, et cetera. Uh, if you go to SciSafeFoundation.org, that's, that's the foundation I started some time ago, which is S-A-I-S-E-I, -S -E which means rebirth in Japanese, SciSafeFoundation.org. There's a projects page where you can see the various universities and a lot of the researchers. Uh, I've been looking for this to see where all the research is actually occurring. You actually made a page. I was telling somebody recently, like, there should just be a place people could go to see where the progress has been. Because people are not aware of how much people, I think it's next year that MDMA will be available in therapy in some psychiatric settings, right? Uh, if I'm understanding the... Yeah, I'd have to check the latest and greatest. It's mm. uh, certainly last time I checked in, it would be as, as potentially as soon as the end of, say, 2023 or early 2024. I'll have to check. Amazing. There's so much in flux because there's not only the federal landscape and potential reclassification, which you can do through demonstrating medical need, because schedule one is supposed to be, and I'm painting with a very simplistic brush here, but schedule one compounds are supposed to be drugs of with a high potential for abuse that have no known medical application. And right. rather than fighting the political fight, which you do have to fight at some point, you can demonstrate medical application through yes. good science and clinical trials, which has been the area where I've predominantly focused. But then you have Colorado, you have Oregon as well. And these parallel systems or initiatives to create parallel systems on a state basis, a statewide basis, uh, that will be very interesting experiments. And they could go a lot of different ways. I mean, it, yeah. it, could, it could all go well. There will probably be, as happens when therapies scale, various issues and problems and scandals and so on. I, I, ex I expect that. Humans are humans, yeah. so they're going to find sure. a way to screw it up one way or the other. <laughs> but net-net, the hope, and I do think there's some a lot of good that has come of, say, the decrim nature, decriminalized nature initiatives, although I disagree with, with some of their stances. It's a very exciting time of flux at the moment. Yeah. And uh, as you put it, there is help out there and there are resources. If you think about what we saw happen with cannabis in this country and yeah. the legalization of it, like life went on. But these drugs are really going to help people, I think, especially with the complex yeah. PTSD, especially yeah. with anxiety. Absolutely. It's just great when combined with a proper therapist. Yeah, they're very powerful. As uh, a friend of mine, I don't think he said it publicly, so I'll keep it anonymous, but a very senior scientist, he said, when you're working with psychedelic compounds, you are working with nuclear power. So you just need to be very, yeah. you need to have the right therapeutic context around it, but they're very, very, very powerful. Jake Al. Yeah. We're, uh, we're coming up. So on, I didn't, I was uh, like, oh, wow, just a quick 75 minutes, 90 minutes. Yeah, yeah. Two hours. So it's two hours. <laughs> we oh, are two, two hours. hours. Two hours plus. Is there anything that you would put, just as uh, winding this to a close, anything that you yeah. would put on a billboard, metaphorically speaking, yeah. like a message, a quote, a word, anything at all, that if you were to get a message out to billions of people, assuming they would understand it, what might you put on the billboard? Anything at all? Anything on the billboard I wanted to. Wow. There's part of me that wants to tell people, you know, to take chances and that they can do it. Yeah. Like to give it a shot, like to just give it a shot, mm -hmm. right? Like it, it might just work out. Like what if it works out? Mm -hmm. Give it a shot. What if it actually works out? That's my head speaking. And then my heart is just be kind to each other, yeah. especially in the face of when people are unkind. Mm -hmm. Just notice that, like people, and this is coming from me. Like a, I'm a <laughs> brawler. I mean, I'm known for arguing with people. I'm a brawler, but I I don't know what's in the air. I don't know if it's since Trump 
in like this whole polarization in the country, but I would really like to see people be kinder to each other and just have like really open hearted discussions with each other. And I, you know, I think your podcast to a lesser extent, what I'm trying to do on all in, I think there are roadmaps here for people to have productive discussions with each other that move themselves, evolve themselves and evolve humanity. I think that's why podcasting is such a special medium. And I think, you know, you really can have productive discussions with people you disagree with. You can have great relationships. You don't have to agree on everything. You can have great friendships. So have those productive discussions with a, with a big open heart and, uh, you know, develop those friendships. It really is the best part of life. So for me, yeah. I, I don't know. It's like I, the two best things I've done in my life is have great friends and build cool shit. So I guess yeah. that's my billboard. <laughs> have great friends, build cool shit. <laughs> yeah. I put a comma in there. I don't know if I'm allowed to have two sentences. And, you know, just building off something you just said, you can have disagreements with good friends. And I would go so far as to say, if you're not having disagreements where if you don't disagree on anything, someone's not telling the truth. No. Because we're all different. And Absolutely. if you're spending time with people who are thinking for themselves, you're almost certainly going to have things you'll disagree about. And that's part of, that is part of the relationship that is an asset to the relationship but that also means you have to learn how to manage conflict and resolve conflict and do repair also and do repair yeah repair yeah wow that's that's a whole nother podcast that's a whole nother podcast it's a whole nother podcast promise us tim that you're not going to stop I, you know i get worried a little bit of that ah. you stop doing this podcast like you can take a break yeah. But don't ever stop. Like, I mean, you're I 45. If you do that, can you imagine if you do this for another 20 years? Yeah. Like how great this archive of Tim Ferriss podcast is going to be? Yeah. Yeah. Think about the legacy. Oh. It's hard for me to see stopping. I've thought about taking a break after a billion downloads, which uh, should happen in the next few months, actually. And I, as much as I fantasize about like burning it all down and going to live in a hut in the mountains and growing out a beard and like smoking a corn cob pipe and reading books, yeah. as much as I fantasize about that and doing cold plunges in a river and <laughs> running with my dog, there's a lot to the fantasy. Sure. But I can't imagine, as you mentioned earlier, we've had so many private conversations and I think both of us have come away thinking, fuck, why didn't we record that? That would have actually made a fantastic conversation to share. Would have been a great app. Yeah. <laughs> it's the find of a podcaster. I'm going to be seeking out incredible, fascinating people to have conversations with, whether I'm doing the podcast or not. So I might as well record them. It's just amazing the impact it's had on society. I can't tell you how many people like in just, people don't know I know you and, or that we're friends even. And like, and so then I'm, I'm at a dinner party. Oh, do you hear this, you know, this podcast by this guy with this odd thing and I, and it's like all the time it's it's you're really in pop culture in a way that's just really impressive to me it's actually you know what i guess i'm going through it now with all in to a lesser yeah. extent like it really is a weird thing something about being in people's ears yeah makes it incredibly intimate yeah it's very intimate i think airpods specifically like these little things that can you can fall asleep in your ears or you have them in your ears all the time yeah. And this the act of listening to somebody's voice so often so consistently yeah. has created some new phenomenon in the world. And, and yeah. we call it podcasting, but it's really like this like lifelong friendship you have with a personality you've never met. It's really yeah. trippy. It is trippy. It's oh, super yeah. trippy. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I can't of wait course. to see you. Can't wait so, to see you too, man. Uh, so people can find you, Cal Canis. Oh God, oh God, that's a whole separate episode too. <laughs> I saw that. So. <laughs> I was laughing. <laughs> we'll play for charity. We'll play for your psychedelic charity. That will be funny. All right, perfect, perfect. Uh, so you, I'm just Jason on Twitter. Yeah, Jason on Twitter. Jason on Twitter. <laughs> and anything else you'd like to mention before we wrap up? Closing comments, complaints, requests of the audience. <laughs> no, no, I just you know. As I randomly tweeted, like, I don't know, six months ago, I just had this revelation, like, because I listened to like three of your podcasts in one week and I was kind of catching up and I just like, you're a fucking national treasure. It's just good to know you. Oh, thanks, man. I really appreciate that. Congratulations on like, you know, like it wasn't always great. Yeah, like that's true. It was like rough on the beginning and now it's just fucking brilliant. So just congratulations, yeah. like from one oh. person who's been grinding it for a while. Like, it's just great to see you at the top of your game. Oh, thanks, brother. I told you this in a private conversation. It was just like, 
I listen to your podcast. I'm like, wow, he's on the top of his game. It's like watching like Michael Jordan or something to play basketball. It's mm. beautiful to watch. Like, and you, you get the best guests and they just, the, now when you have great guests on, they're enamored with you. And it used to be, you're kind of like, yeah, I'm Tim Ferriss is kind of what I'm doing. They come on and they, and they just want to talk about you. And I'm like, whoa, this is tipped over, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Famous person yeah, yeah. is talking Wild. about your podcast, but you're trying to interview them. I was like, whoa, <laughs> interesting to be Tim Ferriss. Anyway, we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye. <laughs> yeah, we so got to end this podcast at no, some we're point. No, we're going to end it. We're going to end it. We tried to end it five times. I know. We tried to end it five times. This it's because we the, miss the, each other. It's because we miss The tearful goodbyes. And uh, I so I will say this, Jason, thank you. It's lovely to see you. I am studying what you're doing. So it's, it gives me great joy to have you on. And oh. uh, you've inspired me to think about maybe trying my hand at an experimental format with, with moderating, moderating a few folks. Do it. So I'll, I'll give it a go. And this has been a blast. I've learned so much and uh, heard so much. I never thought that I would never would have expected to hear. So I'm so happy we made it happen. We made it happen. Yeah, and to everybody listening, as always, we will have links to everything we discussed in the show notes at tim.blog slash podcast. And until next time, be just a little bit kinder than you think necessary to other people and to yourself. And uh, squeeze the shit out of that box of oranges. Every last drop, folks. Because we're all going to end up on the roof, as in Blade Runner. We're not going to last forever, so make those moments count. Thank you, Jason. I love you, brother. Love you, too.